Hello, everyone out there in Facebook land and YouTube land and all else land. <laughs> Welcome to our discussion. I am so sorry we're a few minutes late, but I have cats and I just cannot get myself up in the morning. I was telling, I was just telling Janice, you know, when I was working, I'd get up early, I'd be out of the house, I'd be at work. Yeah, thank you, Paula. We were just talking about how awesome you are. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you sharing this all over the place and, and being here for us because I'm absolutely inept. I couldn't even get it to um, to tag on um, Janice on this page for some reason. I don't I don't know why. I'm going to share it to the. Um, oh, I was going to share it to Two Voices because Janice can't. I mean, um, Paula can't share it there. But thank you, Paula, so much for sharing this around, you guys. I really appreciate it because once we go live, then I get a URL that I can share. But I can't, I can't share a URL until I'm live. And once I'm live, then I'm talking to you guys. So I either have to like come on like five or eight minutes before we start, so you guys can just watch me share links around. <laughs> we can't win. All right. Anyway. Hello everyone, this is Janice Boynton and this is our fourth or fifth uh, video. We have a channel set up on our YouTube site, About Time um, Project, no, About Time Channel, About Time Project Channel. Please give us a nice shout out and a subscribe. I'm going to send you the link right this second while we're here, while I'm thinking about it. I've got like nine, how much, I got like 900 tabs open over here. So. Uh, there we are. And Rob Palmer is with us. Here's our channel. Please subscribe. We have 77 subscri sub subscribers. We hit 100. <laughs> we could do some more interesting things with our channel. And if we hit 1,000, wow, we could do a lot more amazing things. So subscribe to our channel. It's brand new. So I'm not really too freaked out about it because we're getting a ton of hits and a ton of comments on Facebook Live. And Janice was just telling me last time that we talked how much she really enjoyed the comments on Facebook Live. And I do too, because it feels like we're hanging out with you guys and answering your questions. And if, if we're not really clear about something, you ask us and then we can kind of answer it. Because what happens when you're into this a lot is a facilitated communication, RPM, we can tend to fall into some kind of like language where we, it's same thing with Wikipedia and all other things. You you start to start to use words like Bickman and and Crosley and stuff and people are like wait what are you talking about? I have a cat and if I pet him he's going to want more attention. So and I can't lock him out because then he'll just meow 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 meow. So Janice, how are you? I'm fine. Yeah, it's good that we could chat today. <laughs> this one um, we are going to talk about um, false allegations of abuse and some other crimes that facilitators have. Um, perpetrated so it's it's a kind of a heavy-duty topic um, it's also one that I have personal experience with so it's a little bit emotional for me mm -hmm. um, but I think it's really important to talk about these things um, try to understand some of why they happen and maybe talk about some of the ways that um, we can improve communication to make sure that they don't happen again um, they're, they're they started Pre Rosemary Crosley, who is the the leader of facilitated communication, and they've continued to the present day. So it's it's a topic that we really needed to discuss. So badly, yeah. yeah. We've been hinting that we're going to do this talk. I I'm um, optimistic, but a bit skeptical. We're going to get through this topic mostly today. But I guess we'll be able to give people enough examples that they'll be able to understand. We can, yeah, we can, what, what I'd like to do, if we can, um, there's a couple um, really important cases to talk about, and that will set the groundwork, and then if we have to do, talk more about it, then we can, but this will, this will kind of um, give a framework. Okay, um, so give them, give them your uh, couple minutes of what is facilitated communication and um, RPM, and then we'll be able to start a little, with okay. those few people who haven't really been watching. Yep. Um, facil and and please go back. We've um, you've started a playlist on the YouTube 
um, channel in the About Time project that um, covers the uh, that we've had. So if you're not sure about what facilitated communication is or RPM after this, please go go back and, and look visit at the, the Wikipedia uh, page. Yeah, and visit what the What a Wikipedia. concept. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. I hear it's going to uh, be a thing these days. I, I heard a rumor that Wikipedia might catch on. It might. It might. <laughs> <laughs> so um, facilitated communication is a technique that has been used since, um, well, for about 30 years with people with severe communication difficulties. So autism, cerebral palsy, um, other kind of developmental disabilities. And the premise behind it is that you provide the facilitator, who's usually a typically speaking person, um, adult generally, um, supports the person with disability physically and emotionally and they're able to because of that physical and emotional support they're able to type words out onto a, a communication board it might be just a like a um, photocopied letter board or it might be back in the day it was a typewriter now it's an ipad or other communication device um, rapid prompting method ha is also uh, and and a third one that sort of come um, out of facilitated communication um, is eye tracking techniques as well, which we've talked about in the past, but um, rapid prompting method is um, it's the same thing as facilitated communication, only the, the facilitator holds a board up in the air and the person with disabilities touch, touches the board, um, so supposedly without any cueing, but we know that that actually happens. Um, due to the idiomotor response and, and um, a lot of um, <clears throat> physical and, and verbal cueing from the facilitators. So um, by the 1990s, actually in Denmark, it was, it was um, used in the 1970s and debunked in 1970. Then it jumped to Australia, which um, started Rosemary Crosley and her crew started using it in the um, 1980s. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then it came to the United States in around 1990, and kind of just took off from there. Um, by the by, the mid 1990s, 94, 95, there had been enough scientific studies done to show that the facilitators and not the people with disabilities were the ones that are controlling the the um, communication. So there's no um, the 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 proponents of FC and RPM have provided absolutely zero evidence that um, um, facilitated communication were, I'm, and I'm going to call all of facilitated communicate all of the techniques. I'm going to use the umbrella term facilitated communication or FC um, to to um, ex you know kind of encompass all of them. Yeah, it'd be so, too much otherwise. Yeah. yeah. So there's major organizations like American Speech Language Hearing Association, American Psychological Association, many others that have looked into facilitated communication and um, determined that there's no scientific evidence that the communications are independent and have developed um, policies opposing facilitated communication because of the, the problem with facilitator influence. So. Um, it's not a technique that is is um, recommended by any of the major organizations. In fact, um, the International Society for Augmentative and Alternative Communication um, actually calls it a human rights violation because the it, they don't recognize it as a um, as a scientifically based um, technique to use and and believe that because the facilitators are imposing their own words onto the people with disabilities that it's a human rights violation. So it's pretty serious. <clears throat> and what, the reason why we're talking about it still is that um, universities like um, Syracuse University, um, University of Northern Iowa, there's um, um, uh, Cal Lutheran, um, University of Maine, actually has a professor still, at least one professor still that's promoting it, um, University of um, Virginia. So it's, it's still being taught in and um, promoted in universities as if it's a legitimate 
um, communication, and it, it just isn't, they just haven't provided the, the evidence. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, the, the proponents will say because it's been around for 30 years, they and that people using fc say that it works then it does work and it survived all the criticism and they, that that's why they should still be using it so um. yeah so rob palmer has asked our, uh if we're going to be talking about dj the uh, documentary or not today um and that's spelled d-e-e-j and people can look that up on wikipedia because it's we've written the wikipedia page for yeah it. Um, um, he the, says it annoys him, and I said to respond to him, we're hoping to have Craig Foster on to talk with us at the same time when we do. The, um, there's a, to explain what Deej is, Deej is a movie that um, features um, a young man named DJ Severis, and he um, has autism, and he, um, through the through the documentary, which is now available on um, PBS, which is really annoying, um, they follow him through the last couple years of his high school experience, and he applies through facilitated communication. He applies to Oberlin College and gets accepted into Oberlin College. So they they actually follow his progress um, during that time, and um, he actually graduated. Sorry, I've got something sticky on my. I'm trying to just get it off my hand. <laughs> I was uh, I was collaging this morning, so I have I have like the beautiful uh, artist. You guys check out her website. Um, What's your website? Uh, Pinecone and Sparrow. Pinecone and Sparrow. Okay, check that yeah. out whenever we're done. <laughs> She's making um, a collage for somebody right now. <laughs> <laughs> and so he he um he actually the uh, Oberlin College awarded him two degrees. And um, there's no indication at all that he did any of the work by himself. It was all facilitated. Wow. And so because of, because of, there's a lot to talk about with that movie, we're going to actually do another segment um, just based on the Deej movie. We'll, we'll cover it. Yeah. It's too much to uh, deal with one time. We've We've said this before. There's, you just think you're you're talking about something simple with facilitated communication, but it actually is quite complex, and so that's why we've had so many um, discussions about it, and will continue to for a while. I think mm -hmm. we're also we're also um, lining up some people who have and um, and know some of the areas of facilitated communication like the testing and the, some of the history and and that kind of stuff um experts um that know a little bit more about it than i do um we're, we're lining up some people to talk with us too about it to get another perspective psychologists and and communication people and so yeah we've got a bunch of people who are who are dying to talk it's it's this seems to be pretty popular they're they're like this is the first and only time that we know of of a this is kind of you've always wanted to do a conference on fc this is right. kind of a conference on fc but anybody can attend it's a crash course we could be this we could be in college universities all over they could be using our talks right now janice <laughs> i think they are actually i know i've heard some from some professors who are using our talks so that's good oh, really yeah and everybody's dying to know what the, the cats are wearing these days and you know, what hat he has on and you know what t-shirt I'm wearing today and it's so interesting. What is what plants for my garden? <laughs> these right. are for my garden by the way. Just well saying. one of the, one of the things with FC is that the the promote the proponents of FC really make a critics out to be these really horrible people that are against um, people with disabilities. And so what well, yeah it's and it's a, it's been a it's actually been a really effective strategy because people don't they're because of their work or or um personal relationships or whatever they don't want to come out against facilitated communication because they will get slammed for being um against people with disabilities and and one of the reasons why i talk out is that um my name is linked with i was a former facilitator and um the case that i was involved with is is one of the ones that we're going to talk about today that led to false allegations of abuse with um families and um 
because my name is associated with um, the situation and facilitated communication, I've really felt for a long, even right after um, the, I went through double blind testing, which you're not supposed to do. Um, and we'll talk about that as we go along too. Um, I just felt like I didn't have the critical thinking skills to get out of that or, or to avoid facilitated communication. But I think it's really important to talk about this issue and try to understand it. Um, and really they can't say much about me that I'm going to care about, you know, because I know that I've done everything. I can't change the past, but I can do everything I can to, to help educate people and try to keep it from happening again. So, um, I'm in a unique position mm -hmm. um, and it's been helpful that like Susan and some of the other people that we'll have on are willing to step up and speak out against it as well because um, otherwise there I know I, I'm in contact with people that just can't because of their workplace they're getting pressure to you know they they're they're they don't believe in it but their workplace believes in it and they're because of their jobs they can't really speak out so I feel like I feel like we're the ones that can be a voice for, for those people. Yeah. Well, that's kind of ironic considering we're saying that the people's voices are being taken away. Well, yeah, true. <laughs> that's kind of, that's true. We're, we're aware of that I irony. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of irony with yeah. so, facilitated communication. So, um, we're going to talk about some pre pretty heavy topics today, you guys. So don't, yeah. you know, we might be laughing and giggling about it a little bit and rolling our eyes, but it is serious serious what we're going to be talking about today because it's kind of like you just you know what I watch the news at night and I hear the newest stupid thing said and you just kind of laugh you're like oh my gosh we're all gonna die <laughs> and then you laugh <laughs> it just yeah <laughs> anyway so um the reason why I'm able to speak out is because I have nothing to do with facilitating communication it's just kind of a an interest of mine and I see more and more parallels to it, to the psychic world. And so, um, and you were telling me about that too, because I just had a reading, anybody who hasn't watched this live reading that was given to me on Sunday with the psychic, who I feel was cold reading. In other words, she was just looking for generalities and, and throwing them out there. Like your grandmother had an apron and uh, you love gardens and you're really a nice person, but you're also really tough and cold reading. Um, Janice afterwards she watched the whole thing I was really shocked that was like two and a half hours <laughs> your thoughts on that well, it's fascinating because um, one of the things uh, I'll talk about a little bit about double blind testing right now is that you're not supposed to the one of the things about facilitated communication is you're not supposed to um, question the the um, competence of the person with disabilities so double blind testing is absolutely a no-no for for people who are facilitators and they they continue the the promoters of of this technique continue to take that stand and so um but but because of the situation i was in the the um through facilitated communication we had allegations of um possible abuse at home and so I was, I went to uh, uh, the school system, moved forward the, with those allegations and called the Department of Human Services in. And um, we went through a, um, a DHS interview, um, forensic interview, talking about uh, the abuses, of, like who, what, where, when, that kind of thing. And it, and it, and it came out, um, it, it's, it's not true, but, it came out that the the parents and the the family members were involved with um, uh, abusing the child. Um, that's all through facilitated communication, all fake. But I didn't know it at the time. We didn't know it at the time, and so because of that, um, I went through double blind testing. Um, I was kind of between a rock and a hard place because um, I had also gone to a training at University of Maine. They had two day trainings back then, um, and it was very clear there you're not supposed to test it that's going against the, wow. the the guidelines and so i was kind of as a facilitator who believed you know what do i do do i do i test it or do i let this you know we didn't know what was going on whether the allegations were true or not 
um, it, it just became very important to, um, the, uh, I was working with a guardian at Lightham who had been hired to, a lawyer who had been hired to protect the, the uh, look out for the interests of the two children involved. And he kind of appealed to my sense of what was right in terms of, you know, you, these are serious charges. We really have to know where those communications came from, um, you know, and th that he would be there to the, the, in the workshops, you get this feeling that the testing is going to be really aggressive and that, that, you know, it's going to be harmful or stressful to the, to the person with disabilities. So um, he assured me that he would be there if the, if the child was under any kind of distress that he would, he would stop the session. So because of that, I, I agreed to the double blind testing. And um, what I learned from the testing was that um, I had these kind of breakthrough moments during the, during the course of, there were, there were several activities. One of them was um, we were shown pictures and sometimes um, they were, she and I saw the same one and sometimes they were different. There was another section where um, they asked me questions about her family that I wouldn't know, like, you know, what's her favorite toy? Um, when she gets home, she goes, she used to go directly towards a toy that she liked. You know, what was that? What was uncle so-and-so's vans, you know, the color of his van, that kind of thing, stuff that I wouldn't know. And then there was a, um, there was another activity where she went in out in the hall I, I didn't have any access to what happened to, out in the hall. Um, apparently she was shown a key, told what it was, she touched it, you know, like looked at it, and then she came back in and, and um, the, the examiner said, you know, what, what did you see in the hall? And, and there wasn't any answer. And then he pulled a, out, a, out of a key, and, a key out of his pocket and said, well, what's this? And she typed out key. So what happened was all of the, all of the questions were based on all the, all the answers to the questions were based on information that I had seen the pictures, mm -hmm. all the pictures that, that um, had correct answers were all ones that I had seen. Um, and then, and all of the questions about her family were completely wrong and the key, the key situation. So by the end and, and during that time, I had these breakthrough moments where I was thinking, well, um, what, what, what is she seeing? Or, you know, is it different than mine or the same as mine? And, and these breakthrough moments made me realize that there's a, there's a certain, like, I don't know how to describe it except to say like an FC conversation that happens in your head. And then there was this other one that, that was like breaking through and saying, you know, like what's going on here. So it, it made me realize and much, much later, um, it, I was kind of left after the testing to deal with this all on my own, but much, much, excuse me, much, much later talking to um, some experts, I realized that probably what was happening, and this is what I, what, what I think occurs with facilitators is that they make up an idealized, person in their head and that's who they talk to so the the convert the fc conversation is completely internal um so it might be a cold reader like a cold yeah like that like that's psychic. what when when i was watching the psychic she she described like um feeling like the answers were somewhere else in her brain that that she had she described it as like a white space that she kind of thought about in her head and that was, I don't know that I would describe my experience exactly like that, but it was that, that's, that resonated with me when she was talking about that. And, and it, the fact that she felt like um, it was the right answer because she felt like it was, she was really sure inside her somewhere that it was the right answer. And that's also something that I felt like you, you, um, you convince yourself that even if, even if it's a wrong answer, you convince yourself that it's it's the right one. So, for example, I'll give an example. Sure. So, um, say she wants. Say you're talking to the person, and it's lunchtime, and there's a pizza and a hamburger for lunch, and she types out hamburger, 
that she wants a hamburger through facilitated communication. So when you go to the cafeteria, you're expecting her to, to um, get the hamburger. And she picks up the pizza instead. And you say, and the way the facilitated brain works isn't, oh, she typed out the wrong answer. You say to yourself, oh, she changed her mind on the way to the cafeteria. So she must have really meant pizza. So, and these things I think happen all the time. You know, oh, I moved her hand that time, but I won't next time. You know, these little flashes of awareness, I think are, are, um, are evident in every facilitator, but um, because it's, a, it's, it's an, in a non-structured situation, you, you just pass right over them. But in a testing situation, like everything, I had people looking at me and I was like really, you know, like you, you've got all that attention, you're, you're really aware of your own actions in the, that situation. And that's why I was that that's the reason why I was really aware of those breakthrough moments in my head. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, so that that's kind of like how I believe facilitated communication works. Um, and and the reason why the science afterwards when I was I didn't get um, access to double blind testing, they had just been starting my experience was around 91 92. Um, facilitated communication came to the United States around 1989, uh, 89, 90, somewhere in there. And so the, the double blind testing had just been happening and being published. It takes a little bit of time for the science to catch up. And um, by the time I was able to see the double blind testing, which also had like the picture um, exercise, um, it was exactly like what I had experienced. And it, it's like, so the science kind of backed up my experience and not the other way around. Um, now, uh, we'll, get, we'll, talk, we'll get into some of the cases, the, uh, but while we're talking about it, um, I know one of the questions people have with the, um, the uh, uh, false allegation of abuse cases is where do those, where does the abuse, language and the stories come from absolutely i think we should that, that took that, that right. took me i've had that question it's like well where did i mean janice accused this kid of, of being molested by her father and brother her little her other her older older brother i guess yeah and where does that come from how do you just hi how's it going my dad's been molesting me <laughs> you know i mean where is that coming from and i think that it's really important that we answer that question right off because i really do think that the people who are facilitators like you were are doing this out of the the goodness of their heart they're not out some kind of manic crazy well, i can't even say those words they're not like these people out there who are on a vendetta to you know accuse not me. usually no I, th I mean i think there's yeah there have been stories where really where the the um like the mom and dad are having a disagreement oh, about whether fc works or not and then all of a sudden the mom's facilitating with the child and abuse allegations start coming out against the dad so there there are but i don't even that i'm not sure is totally conscious conscious so what I believe happened in my situation, and I can really only speak to my situation, is that um, a couple things. We the there was another facilitator who had gone to the to the workshops, and before I did, I was working with her first, and then then later on went to the workshop. Um, what they tell you in the workshop, and what was what was pretty. Um, um uh, i can't think of the word rest uh, you common whatever uh, uh, in in the teachings of the early 1990s is that when people um have disabilities that the chances are that they have an increased chance of being um uh, a, a victim of abuse at home or wherever not Prayed just upon home, sexually because they have no ability to respond right towards, right uh, so you know so that's kind of that, built like a per human body they have yeah 
so they're 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 more vulnerable to abuses so that that's what i was trying to say um and so that was in in the educational teachings as well as in particularly in the facilitated communication community because what they were saying in the workshops was and i um and i don't know it's been a long time since i've been to a workshop so i don't know how much of this is still true um but it's certainly in the literature that um people who are first learning to especially like teenagers which i was working with um who have this ability all of a sudden to communicate for the first time are often often going to come out with um abuse allegations or you know they're going to be angry and they're going to be um they're going to talk about their frustrations about being locked in for so long and silent and that kind of stuff so you're you're as a facilitator you're primed yeah that's to, the word you're looking for you were primed to look for abuse yeah and so um and it and the other thing that happened was where we were taught um as an educator you know if people are acting out then you, there may be a suspicion that something is going on at home and now i don't know that when when the when we were talking about that we really understood or i really understood what that meant I mean, sometimes you just say oh that kids having a bad day something must be happening at home and not really mean anything by that but we're very careful about saying that kind of thing um but what happened in in my case there the 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 thing that makes facilitated communication work supposedly is that the person really trusts you it's just like the psychic you know it only works with people that that you trust if they have an open mind and you have to have an open mind and that's in the literature about facilitators you have to be open you have to be you know supportive and and if they trust you then facilitated communication is going to work with you and so um i had been working with um my student for for a while some weeks and all of a sudden she hit me in the face and um she i actually she scratched me too i actually have a scar on my wrist um oh, still yeah. from wow. from when she scratched me so um instead of thinking oh you know this person doesn't really want me in her space anymore <laughs> you know i'm sitting too close to her for too long my head and that of the other facilitator was oh well maybe something's happening at home and so once that seed is planted then the 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 um it increases the chances that abuse allegations are going to come out in the in the facilitated communications and it didn't come out all at once um it came out over a uh, a bit of time and the other facilitator and I were both getting these kind of communications so and and the other thing that happens is um that you share information without really realizing that you're sharing information so you know like an offhand comment like well yeah I think something might be going whether she said it first or I said it first something might be going on at home you know whatever that as soon as that's planted in your head you're going to come out with abuse allegations and so what happened was um and they were graphic they it was so that the da you know but I, I sat down with the the um special education teacher who was a skeptic fc never worked with her but we're in a situation now with um we've got these notes saying that she's she's disclosing information about possible abuse allegations what do we do if this was a typically speaking person then we would move forward even though we didn't none of us thought to not to to until the the guardian at light um his first reaction was we need to test the communications but that wasn't our first right no wait i'm gonna okay. pause you for just a second yeah when i think you're there's paper or something next to your microphone when you move the paper it makes a <laughs> noise oh something. no maybe my am i moving um, just I me moving so. maybe like, i'll see you look kind of look down and like you're moving something here oh maybe okay 
I won't. Something I won't. your microphone yeah. down there. So I just want to. Maybe it may be, it may be a, like a thing I'm picking here. Um, <laughs> but what I was going to say, as we're going through Janice's experience, this is extremely stressful. And, and um, you guys pay attention to what Janice is saying. This is this is in the 90s. She really had no idea what was going on. Um, she'd taken this workshop. She was told not to test. And she didn't really have a place to go and look and find out a lot about facilitated communication in the early 90s. So some of these, some of these stories we're going to talk to you guys about as we go along, you're going to see happened in the late, you know, like 2008 to you know, other, later on. And, and uh, you can see how they're saying, I had no idea. This, a lot of these facilitators, they really, really believe they're communicating with this person and they don't know enough about facilitating communication to understand they're 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 the one communicating this and also um oh i also want to mention i can only see so many comments on on the facebook and i see yours linda and i wrote it down so we'll come back and we'll answer that whenever janice gets a little further along um but um janice is obligated to report any abuse that she has been and again i'm going to emphasizes she is primed to look for this because this is one of the things they got like a two or three day teaching class and this is a good chunk of what they're teaching you is that there's a very likely chance that they're going the student is going to come out with a bunch of abuse about uh, allegations about complaining have been frustrated about their abuse um, or being locked in and what took them so long for somebody to communicate with me and so um you know give her a break here you guys i know you do i do <laughs> this isn't like somebody just like i'm gonna go out there and just make allegations this is, comes over time apparently but and we need to talk about this and understand it because this is what's going on yeah go ahead, go ahead yeah, Sorry. Like, facilitated communication at that point um had no no guidelines really they they were there's actually literature that said if you just read a book you know read read this article read this one article then you can be a facilitator go to this two-day workshop you can be a facilitator now they've changed the guidelines since um cases like mine came out however what they say they they say don't test just practice more so if you're just if you're practicing a faulty communication it doesn't or technique it doesn't matter how many um hours you put into it it's still bad it's still wrong you're still doing the communication mm -hmm. so um in fact i actually looked there's been many many studies since since um my case in the early 90s and um it doesn't matter how much training the person had whether it was a two-day workshop or um two or three years from Syracuse University, they all equally are susceptible to um, facilitator um, uh, uh, control of the communications. And now there were a lot of people early on that said that had doubts, but they were like, well, we're, we're willing to give it a try. Maybe it works with some people. And that's, those are the people, there were some people who were also um trained in scientific techniques that right away said there's something wrong with this technique but there were many people it wasn't just um a few people there were many many people experts psychologists speech language clinicians you know you name it that were sitting on the sidelines saying well m maybe they were either thinking one or two things maybe it could work with some people someday and the second one was this is so ridiculous that it no way that it's going to take off you know and and so the the times were quite a bit different and and there weren't a lot of um you know i couldn't just google it and come up with information so yeah um it is important to note the, uh, that my case was one of the well actually in the by um 1993-94 there were dozens of of false allegation of abuse cases um that came out so um um i i can't remember where we were with my story but i i think that's a 
a good kind of segue into like how you know were these allegations unique or were they new or and who they happened to and and so um i had alluded to um denmark who had some form of facilitated communication in the 1970s and by um i've got notes here just because i want to get it right um by 1986, they had had an abuse allegation and they had tested it and decided that it was facilitator control. So by by the time that Rosemary Crosley was um, marketing facilitated communication pretty heavily, um, Denmark had already debunked facilitated communication as facilitator control. So had they done their due diligence, then they would have realized that there was something pro uh, problematic with the technique. So the next, the next case that came up that um, actually I didn't learn about this until um, I think it was it was after 2012 because I had written an article about my experiences in 2012 um, because of another false allegation abuse case that had happened um, shortly before that. Um, and I had read a book by um, Diane, I don't know how to say her last name, but she wrote a book called uh, A Passion to Believe and it, and it studied facilitated communication. And in it, she referenced um, an Australian case called the Carla case. And um, it happened in 1990 and it was reported in 1992. Um, and this was a case by, um, that involved a 28 year old woman. The, the police showed up at her family's house one day and, and um, said that um, in her daycare provider center, the center where she went, um, had um, come up with abuse allegations against her family. And um, the, it turns out that the, the facilitators were rosemary crosley who's the leader of of facilitated communication and eight of her facilitators um, eventually over the course of a period of time came up with allegations against um, carla's family and um <clears throat> so this is this is something that's plagued facilitated communication right from the very beginning and in fact um Facilitated communication is very like automatic writing. And if you go back to the early 1900s, there were many cases about false allegations of abuse through automatic writing as well. So there's some, there seems to be something with the process and the, the stream of consciousness kind of um, activity that is facilitated communication that brings out these kinds of um, the dark side of people's imaginations, I think is what happens. Um, oh, I was going to talk about, um, again, how, how, how do you get these, um, fabricated and very graphic pornographic, um, messages through facilitated communication. And, and, and that's a question that's plagued me for a really long time. But what I think is I went into the DHS interview believing that she might be um, being molested by her father at home and anybody any one of us can imagine what that might be like and then you go into the dhs interview and they're asking um who what where how many times where were you touched and because of the nature of facilitated communication and we saw it with the psychic the other day um you just your brain wants to fill in those those um, answers times, uh, whether they're true uh, or not yeah where was yeah. uh the bedroom right right and and oh um if if it's happening that many times x number of times then how come the mom didn't know well the mom must have known she must have been complicit then everybody in the family should have known and you know that kind of thing so your brain um what happens is you're also taught as a facilitator you're taught to believe the written word over any spoken words so you're it's oh wow that's it's really messed up it's a psychologically messed up place to be generally you know you're you're asking and answering the questions saying no and 
verbally right. saying no or pushing away, you're not supposed to believe that. You're supposed to right. believe it's written down. Right. Wow. And, that's yeah. And because it's written down, you're like as a person, you're like, oh my gosh, this is really this really happened. And so there's a cycle, there's a cycle that happens in, in the facilitator's head that that and and uh, and you're not like a lot of the testing that's been done truly people don't the facilitators generally do not know that they're the ones moving the person's hands they generally you know it's it's in all of the literature that they they really genuinely believe that the communications are coming from the other person it's like the psychics that believe that they're getting messages from a spirit they're giving that they call it agency to the other person. And so the facilitator really has no, you're in, in psychic terms, you're channeling the other person, but that's not really what happens. You know, I, I really think that it just all happened. It's an internal conversation, but because of the circumstances, you're, you're believing that, that the messages that are coming out through FC are real. And so you're not supposed to test it either. Yeah. No test. And so you, I just think it's an overactive, I mean, this is very simplistic and I understand maybe more than most people how serious this is, but it's, it's an overactive imagination. That's what happens. And you're in that situation. And then, then, uh, you know, if it was a typically speaking person, then you wouldn't, you're supposed, you're trained to, whether you believe it or not, you're trained to, to, um, investigate it right mm -hmm. and so there's also the, a, a certain aspect of your brain that's saying well i don't know if these are true or not but um it's up to the now now that these messages are out it's up to the investigators to figure out whether it's true or not so it's it's i think it's a very complicated and very um confusing and messed up psychological place to be to be in a, a facilitator in that situation now what happens with most facilitators is that they they have there's documentation that um other facilitators in a similar position to mine have gone through the double blind testing and come out still believing that fc is real and so Wow. what what they what they say in fact one of them said oh it's e it, it would have been easier i could have facilitated easier if i had known the answers to the questions and so that which okay you know that's true if i'd read a, if the psychic had read me multiple times before i'm sure she would have gotten a lot of hits this time when right she right it's the same it's the same and they and so mo the other thing that happens and oh, and i I truly could have gone, I believe I could have gone one way or the other um, quite easily. You, you start after the testing. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't debriefed and I wasn't given any support afterwards. So I was oh left God. to figure out. Yeah. The, well, the school system were like, okay, we don't want anything to do with this because you, the family might sue us. And the FC people were like, you're a bad facilitator. You know, and and I didn't. I knew the only thing that saved me was I did know a couple um, um, people who were skeptics that kept in touch with me. Um, and Howard Shane, Boston Children's Hospital was one, and John Palferman, who who was the producer of um, Prisoners of Silence. He's a he was trained as a um, as a science communicator um, and journalist, so he he understood what was going to, with FC um early on and he those two people got me the od hack you know the the evidence-based information and talked with me and kind of helped me through that situation but but had i been left on my own um i could have easily gone with what the fc people i could have said yeah i was a bad facilitator i just need more training i need more i need to go to the training more right you know, and and um, easily could have gone that route, and um, I'm glad that I didn't. But well, yeah, we're all glad the, you didn't. You're doing a, a much the, better, the more help here. Yeah, 
I mean, the psychological pull of that is like, how do you come to terms with the fact that you're the one that's been um, writing all these messages and it doesn't matter whether it's pizza for lunch or dad did something to me. You know, it doesn't, those, it's the <laughs> same. And that's, I think, I think that's hard for a lot of people to understand. It's like those two facilitated messages are both facilitated controlled messages that even though they have different connotations to people it's the same thing it's equally it's equally serious in my mind um but the 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 false allegations have broad reaching obviously broad reaching consequences that we don't always attribute to you know the the sky is blue and there are rainbows and i like unicorns you know it's it's sort of like um to me they're equally they're equally bad in terms of um exploiting people with disabilities um but absolutely anyway. i was thinking of um when i was a teenager there was a car accident in front of our house the car hit another car and we looked out the window and we saw the car that that did the damage you know driving away and the police came to the house and they were like well, what did the car look like and i can remember I have that kind of personality. I guess you might call it like a helper personality. I want to help. I want to. I want to assist. I want to be the person who's the the good person who stands up and says, "I have the answer to you know." I want to. I guess that's I, that's probably true with most human beings. But I can remember possibly embellishing what I saw. Like you know, the police officers. Like, well, do they have round headlight tail lights, or was it like square, like rectangular headlight? And I can remember thinking, am I filling in the details of what I think I saw or what I really saw or what I want to say I saw to be able to help? And I guess it's the same thing with court cases. You know, when you have people who are in the courtroom with shackles on and, and you know, dressed like a criminal, you know, in their orange jumpsuit or whatever, you can look out at him and you can say, that person looks like a criminal. He definitely is a criminal. I think I'm, and, and you don't consciously say I, he's the one I saw, but you start filling in the the details a little bit because you want to help along the case. And look at all these good, look at that family that, over there that's been harmed so badly. It must have been this guy because why else would he be in this courtroom with the shackles on and the orange jumpsuit? It's that eyewitness kind of mentality of wanting to help out. It's it's a flaw of sorts in our in our i don't want to say dna but in our humanness mm -hmm. that makes us compassionate and um you know a lot of really good things probably but it also we need to be aware of it again you know we need dna we need we need fingerprints we need cell phone tower technology you know we need some factual um not just an eyewitness and and uh linda rosa one of the things she said i haven't forgot what else she said earlier but uh the false allegations of fc remind me of the recovered memory hysteria of the 1990s and i know paul linda would say the same thing the satanic panic and and all that this kind of feels like the same thing this the allegations i believe in the mcmartin preschool trial were getting really ridiculous that there was a tunnel underneath the school and they were bringing in like zebras and elephants to molest the kids and they went and flew in a plane to the moon or something sure. and the people the 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 court is still sitting there going yep yep must be true yeah yep, must be true because who could make a five-year-old lie no i can't uh, people have brought up that because i that was happening the same about the same time that the false allegations were coming out through facilitated communication um, mine and and several others i can't um really speak to that in a conscious way but i can i there were you know um subconsciously probably i was picking up on some of that i think some of the media some of the television shows were were sort of um promoting that at roseanne Barr and you know all those people oh gosh um, oh man i'm still angry at her for that and oh, yeah and so that was that was it's the parents you see yeah. her father just crying and his mother her mother just crying how could she say that about us yeah 
it's it's not something that I thought about until much later when one of the reasons why I keep speaking about this is that um, early on I spoke out against it. I went on, um, I didn't do Prisoners of Silence. I did talk to, I did talk to John Palferman quite a bit behind the scenes, but I was getting pressure from my school system not to, not to talk to um, reporters. And so I didn't actually get videoed um, during Prisoners of Silence, but later on, um, Hugh Downs was doing another, the, um, another film about, or, or show about facilitated communication. And, and I went on that show and, um, and ended up, I apologized to the family on air and that was a whole kind of big deal kind of thing. Um, I remember it because it was supposed to um, air the same time that um, Richard Nixon died that same day so it got bumped a week so that's the only reason why i remember when the show aired was it was the week after <laughs> president Nixon died um what is but that? yeah uh, it, i don't know like that's what's it's fascinating to me the the psychological aspects of facilitated communication and and psychics and that kind of thing are it's it's fascinating to me um because um uh, i think uh people that we we would say are compassionate and have good intentions and all get caught up in this without really realizing um how they did it and why they did it you know there's not a lot of thought um given to that part of it the but um the fc the proponents of this are not interested at all in in talking about you know hearing from facilitators they they in general they um, will be the first ones to say those are bad facilitators. They were trained poorly. In fact, the the person who trained me went on 2020 and said that I was trained poorly. So that was kind of interesting. And they're the yeah. So yeah, and so and they've got it in their heads that okay, it, you know, it, and that's why it was um, interesting when the psychic was talking too. It's the same. Uh, you know, I couldn't help making connections because oh, that person was saying. Yeah all these other people that were doing these readings aren't the real deal, but I am. And that's how facilitators feel as Absolutely. well. You don't see the mistakes in, other, in yourself, but you see them in other people. So when you talk to a facilitator, they'll say, and in the literature, they'll say, oh yeah, there's, there's facilitator movement, but it's other people. I'm, I'm too conscientious to do I that. I never do that. Yeah, and, and, and you the don't. The testing aspect, the same thing. This psychic, I asked her about testing and. And how I, I put it this way, I said, there are some people in the psychic community that you would consider fraudulent. And if so, I, well, I asked her, would you consider, and I know she would because she'd sent emails to me saying that she knew of people who were frauds, like, you know, and I said, if you would consider there are people in your community that are frauds, how could they be outed? What kind of test could be done to, to, to remove them from the community or to to expose them and she could not the the concept of testing was not even not even on her radar the only thing she thought of this is her whole test now you guys ready for this is that when she gave a reading to somebody and they responded saying that was accurate that is all she believed was testing that is that's it and I've heard this for years over the psychic communities. They say, well, you've never, you, you know, you've never had a reading by me. So how can you know that I'm fake? And it's like, well, a reading by you isn't going to give me any information. I mean, that's, I, you can't not Google Susan Gerbic and come up with, you could probably find my second grade teacher. I know there's pictures out there of the first car I ever owned and there, it had an accident. You know, there's nothing you could tell me that I wouldn't be able to say, well, that was a picture on my Facebook page. And that was a, that was a comment I made on everything is out there. I can't, I cannot imagine, or it's just general knowledge that's common to everybody. Yeah. No, the idea of testing, as you said, in FC, you're not to do it because if you do, then you're invalidating or, or you are, um, harming the, the, uh, person who needs to be tested by saying they're not, what is it called? You're not presuming competence. Yeah, you got to presume competence, 
And if you challenge them and say, well, we have to test you to see if you're actually doing the, the writing or if it's me, you're insulting them. And, and all of their self-esteem is going to collapse in on itself, I guess. Yeah. And so you're never, ever to challenge their, um, their, their writing. Right. You can't, you can't, uh, what's, falsify it. No, no, no. And if, if, like I said before, you know, the, with the pizza thing or, or the, even the abuse, the abuses, it's sort of like, well, if that detail wasn't exactly correct, it must have been similar because the per you know, this, you, you can, you know, I, I think FC is a lot about rationalizing away the answers, you know, the, um, Douglas Bicklin wrote, he's the guy that brought it to the United States. He wrote an article called Communication Unbound in 1990. That's what sparked this movement in the United States. And he, he they knew at the time about, um, the critics were saying this is awfully close to um, we, what we see with people using a planchette and the Ouija board. And his response was, well, it's not. You know, they didn't, they didn't test it. They didn't, you know, like if, if I, I think that they've failed terribly in, in um, not, if they really want, they, they, they're promoting this is, is right from the beginning is something that was going to change the course of autism. And in some ways, I guess it has. Um, um, but if they were really if this technique ha could stand on its own, then you would think that they would ta have taken all those criticisms, including the false allegation abuses that were coming out, um, that were dozens by the early 1990s. Um, you would think that they would, they would really want to um, make adjustments to their technique, but, but they didn't. They didn't in a way that was meaningful. They continued the only, because the only way that is meaningful is double blind testing. That's the only way when two people are, are typing on a keyboard at the same time, there's no, there's no way that you can tell who's, who's typing what, unless you do double blind testing. And then you can get an idea of, of how much control one has over the other, but you can't, you can't distinguish between the two if they're both typing at the same time. Um, and so that's a major flaw in the in the technique that they are not in, they were not interested. They made this big deal about changing the guidelines afterwards, and all that all they said was you have to do more training. You can't you can't be a facilitator after two days. You you take the two day workshop that's an introduction, and then you keep coming back and you practice. You keep paying us to 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 do these workshops, and and you practice, and then you can go forth and multiply or whatever. I don't know. But, um, you know, it's, that's really frustrating to me um, that, that, that that's what their response was. It wasn't, in, in the early days, you could say, you know, it, it may have been a legitimate argument that, okay, maybe I was, let's say, let's say, maybe I was poorly trained. No, I don't think it really matters, but let's say that I was. But what about all the all the allegations that came out afterwards? What about all those people that did take the training, had been using facilitated communication for years, and then got tested and was found that they were doing the they were controlling? Now, now you get to a position where it's not just me and a couple, uh, you know, like a couple dozen quote unquote bad facilitators. It's all these facilitators that were trained directly through Syracuse University or University of Maine when they when they had works I don't think they hold workshops anymore but when they did you know they were pretty active um, in Vermont they had workshops as well and and so what do you do when you take all of those facilitators and they're they're still coming out with the exact same results that that happened when I did the testing or the OD Heck Center um, did their testing and it's not when the testing's done. It's not necessarily Because of false allegations of abuse. It's because people are are, are wanting to know where the communications are coming from so as as as, as recent as 2014 they there was a double-blind um, Testing done and in that one they actually flipped over the they blinded the the facilitator 
they flipped the keyboard over so so there was nothing to type on and they were the students were still typing really? they had no capacity to understand what the keyboard was for they continued to type and so and 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 the excuse that the proponents have is that well the students get stressed or uh, in testing situations or all of a sudden they can't recall one word answers in testing situations because of you know they they have all these excuses about why the testing the controlled testing doesn't work and they just continue on the the way that they they have always continued on mark did a, a brain games episode and we're going to talk to mark eventually about this um a brain games show that he did it's available on on youtube um but it was with ouija board and first they had people go through and do the Ouija board and they were getting answers. And it was very interesting the way, you know, they'd get like one or two letters and then they'd go, yeah, that's it. And then they'd come up with this big long answer for basically just getting one or two letters of, of a long, um, of a long title of a movie or something. Like they came up with a P for something about them. Uh, and they said, yeah, that's my, that's my grandfather's favorite, favorite um, opera, Phantom of the Opera. It was like, you got that. You got that out of one letter. Yeah, yeah. and so and that's what happens with FC too. Yeah, you know. well, you <laughs> fill it in. You're filling in the details, and when they blinded the people in the in the Ouija board experiment, they did. They still moved the planchette, and they still thought they were typing stuff. I mean, you know, moving it to places, but they were typing it on random, just blank spaces on or numbers or, and then when they take the blindfolds off, people still believed. Yeah yeah so it's i mean that's there's an argument that's been in place for quite a long time that that it's a belief system and i i think that's true um and and for a long time the the experts the researchers were looking at the the um person with disabilities but i'm i advocate that people actually look at the facilitators i don't think facilitated yeah. communication in any of its forms has anything to do with people with disabilities i think it has a lot to do with people's desire to connect with their um, loved one or client um, and whatever all that that emotional stuff kind of keeps you hooked into the into and the help. yeah you want to help I yeah. mean, how, isn't that amazing to be able to to communicate with somebody who is um you know who's been locked in all this time and now you're going to be able to to uh facilitate for them and, and communicate for them i mean that must be a really powerful feeling of of helping them yeah it's kind of a head trip yeah <laughs> well, I don't it's know. exciting it's exciting it, it's exciting to think you're the person they trust and that all of a sudden you're helping this person um say what's on their mind you know and 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 it it is a, it, it right from the beginning it's it's advertised now as uh, which i think is really interesting as a technology of last resort technique of last resort and i think that they there's some awareness that's uncomfortable if you think of the leadership but there's some awareness that that um people have tried all the evidence-based or many of the evidence-based techniques and they've been disappointed by them so all of a sudden they've got this miracle cure where they can they can tap into fc and and within weeks or days or, or hours in some cases they can be spelling out complete sentences doing math you know somebody brought up the other day that people were doing algebra and you know all this kind of stuff and, and that's what linda linda rosa had said she said that when especially when you get into the college classes how are facilitators able to they're doing higher math higher science how can you not understand that you are doing this and not the person next to you who is probably not even looking at the keyboard part a good part of the time or yeah. certainly not paying attention to what's happening in a classroom setting how yeah. are they i mean i understand they've really if they're teaching college if they're facilitating somebody in a college class they may have been in this for a long time but how could they rationalize that in their mind yeah. higher, I mean, what if the person's taking a Spanish class or, you know, another language class in college? How do you, and you don't know that language and the person next to you, I don't get it. And I, and that's what Linda Rosa's question, was, especially. Yeah, I, we'll look at that a little bit more in the, when we do the Deeds movie, because there's, there's, um, 
there's actually Hold on, some Linda. Scenes, we'll do that later. <laughs> there's some scenes there's some scenes where he, he I think he received the questions ahead of time but his answers are so they're not even they don't even come out like regular language and and everybody's kind of like they shake their heads for a minute and then they make this they make a connection somehow to what are the words that they and they they pretend that that it's part of the discussion so it's all this it's this ruse that that people on the sideline you know like those those educators in a in a college classroom they don't want to say what's really going on because then they're going to be accused of of discriminating against people with disabilities and oh, that's another imagine. whole that's another whole thing so you know it's it's a i think that i think that the 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 power of the fc story and the 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 complex issues that that are around people with disabilities who are non-speaking um make it really difficult i think that's part of the reason why fc still exists um today yeah so we're going to get into these really powerful stories. I know we keep having the setup to it, and and Janice is is amazingly powerful and and personal story. But we have some really really deep stuff to do. But I want to take like a three minute break, and um, the, I'm going to pause the recording, and then I'm going to appear back. So Janice, if you want to like buzz off for a couple minutes. So everybody okay. watching you guys, give me about three minutes. I'm going to pause the recording, then I'm going to magically appear back in your feed. <laughs> Okay, so we're back. Right. We're back. I was just cold too. I have to put on a light shirt, not the sweater, because that was just way too. And besides, he's sleeping on my sweater now. Huh, Hamilton? Yeah. yeah, he's sleeping on my sweater. He's piled up right here, so I can't really type or anything because he's in front of my keyboard. <laughs> All right, so should we do the Carla case? Okay, so well, you start and then we'll, we'll take turns with different cases. How about that? Because okay. I think the Carla case is is because uh, that sets the groundwork. I think for some of the other cases, yeah. this is the um, this is one of the first ones that happened in uh, it actually happened in Australia. Yeah. All right. So, you get Carla. All right. So Carla, I, I was particularly annoyed by this one because when I took the workshop, the um, the workshop leader said there's going to be some bad press that's coming out about facilitating oh, the same time? but just ignore this it's not true none of the information is true the reporters are out to get us blah 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 so really? so we had a heads up that there was going to be something in it but we didn't have the internet back then either right we did not yeah this was the carla case happened in 1990 but it didn't come out until 1992 and there was a um a reporter named um oh did i write it down i didn't um i can't think of the guy's name anyway he he um he did a series he followed the case over several years and so the 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 woman involved was a 20 i'm looking i have to look at my notes i want to make sure i have have the information right the woman was 28 years old and she had profound disabilities um brought on by encephalitis when she was an infant and oh, so okay she did, have, she did have some basic verbal skills and um which were ignored um when facilitated communication started happening they they ignored her verbal skill the facilitators she actually lived in a really loving home the 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 um her family accepted her the way she was things were fine and then all of a sudden she was introduced to facilitated communication and um so there were eight it, over the course of this this event there were eight facilitators and rosemary crosley who had had tested her previously saying that she had word recognition and spelling skills through facilitated communication and uh they were using a something called the canon communicator which is it, uh, it's sort of like a like a um like the old fashioned calculators that had the, the tape that would come out. So oh, you press like the label button. reader kind of thing. Yeah. So it takes where's the where's the cheese? I want it must be in your hand somewhere. Like, cats. How do we how do we live without cats? I don't know. Or I you guys who don't have cats know what I mean. But I mean how did the internet survive it? Anyway, go ahead. So the, I'm so sorry. The cleaning company actually got um sued later on for false advertising because they they became associated with 
um, saying that you, if you use the Canon communicator, that that people with autism could communicate. So they got, they actually got sued. I knew that. For false advertising. Anyway, that's a, that's an aside. So um, the the abuse allegations of uh, this is from the newspaper article: rape and other sexual deprivations, mostly committed um, at night. They, they came from one of um, Rosemary Crosley's trained facilitators first, and then the, that it kind of spread over the rest of them. And um, some of the, some of the, so the, the family didn't know any of this until the police showed up at their door and, and removed the child, <clears throat> the young woman. And uh, they, they had a chance to um, interact with the child uh, I keep saying child, sorry, the, the woman. Um, and some of the clues that the family had that they had doubts about it were that the communication from the first facilitator said this guy named Joe was the one that was doing the abusing. And that was supposedly the father. Well, uh -huh. the father's name was not Joe. So oh, that's- and would, the child, would the woman have called her child, her dad, Joe? No. I mean, there, she was the dad. It wasn't, or it wasn't whatever they, they say in know, Australia. They didn't know who Joe was. And then the other thing was that they asked her to um, to spell out her dog's name, or you know, what's your dog's name? And she couldn't answer that question. And then her, also her name, her own name, was spelled wrong in so some is, of the. Who the, was doing the facilitating in the police interview? I don't know. They didn't. It was a normal facilitator. But it was her normal facilitator. It was her normal facilitator? Yeah. But she so, couldn't spell her own name right? Right. Right. They, they actually came out with um, four more reports, and um, including, including allegations of sexual, sexual abuse from um, three women and one man. They didn't, they didn't say who that was. But um, so over the court, and then they, um, they sent a, a note to the police saying, this is, quote, I insist on a casework. This is supposedly Carla. Um, and that's not a real name, but that's the one that they used in the press. Um, this was supposedly something that she was telling the police. I insist on a caseworker at once so I can be safe from my family and sexual abuse. I especially seriously resolve to kill myself if I don't get away. So what, what are the police supposed to do? So the police... Um, removed, you know, they, they acted on that information and removed the, removed Carla from her home. And, and that's, I guess that after that, after she was removed, that's when they asked, the family asked Carla, you know, what's the name of our family's dog? And uh, they didn't know the answer to that. Um, and um, later, later the court realized this is after some months. Uh, I don't know if I have it in my notes how long it, it took. Eight, I think it was 18 months, 15 months um, of the family fighting this in court. And um, they, they tested her and she wasn't able to, to identify letters and you know, she didn't, she didn't, she wasn't able to type. So the court said this is the, Carla simply doesn't have the ability to, to do, to have disclosed any of this information. They dropped the case. They, oh, they also, they brought in a, what they call a naive, this is part of the, this is part of the new guidelines for, um, for testing forensic interviews is they bring in what they call a naive facilitator. So the facilitator, the naive facilitator is supposedly somebody that doesn't know anything about um, the situation at all, and is is going to facilitate with the with the client cold, right? So, and and the 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 premise is that if she comes up with the same information or or um, abuse allegations, then the abuses the the allegations must be true. Well, there's a couple of problems with that scenario. One. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, um, when you when you're trained as a facilitator, they go through these guidelines. So you know, as a facilitator, if you're if you're brought into a court case, 
to be a naive facilitator, you know that it's allegations of abuse, right? There's no way that you can't know that. It wasn't a traffic ticket. <laughs> right. It wasn't a traffic ticket. And it, right. Exactly. And then the other thing is, um, there's been cases where they brought in a naive facilitator and the, the um, they both, I think they both um, had disclosures of abuse, but the details are different. So what do you do when the details are different? Who do you believe then? And what they did yeah, in that case was they blamed, they blamed the, the, the child that was facilitated because she was not telling the truth. What the hell? Anyway, so in, in, um, in the Carla case, they brought in a naive facilitator that had been trained by Rosemary Crosley. So they knew. Well, they don't have any more other facilitators. Right. 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 So, so that that kind of you know that's that's useless. But and that's it, in the guidelines. That ties into that, the psychics again too. If the psychic is wrong, the the person you blame is the subject. So, yeah. you know, if 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 the psychic's giving me a reading and I don't understand what she's talking about, it's my fault. Same in this case, if the it's the fault of the um, disabled person. Right. Right. For not for not keeping the facts. Gosh, this is so similar to psychics. Boy, I keep saying all these. It is. I know my head was just going when I watched the psychic session, I was going, oh my God. <laughs> anyway, so uh, the other thing I should note while I'm thinking of it is that the Department of Justice um, now, currently, has a brochure for um, forensic interviews with people, um, you know, how to uh, guidelines for um, oh, really? people with disabilities are are in that situation and they they accept facilitated communication as a as a um as a valid form of communication so just so so people out there that have influence with the department of justice they should know that still, that they, still? Yeah, yeah or is it yeah. state by state no it's federal it's department of justice okay when we finally clean up all the other messes in the world we're going to make sure we get that taken care of yeah so Bicklin was on the Bicklin was on the board, and the ARC in California was the one that actually wrote the guidelines. And they that's, they that's believe odd because they believe there's four the cases standard. they'll say no, we're throwing that out. You know, facilitated the judges is it the judge's discretion to just say we're not going to have any facilitated communication here because we have cases of that. Yeah. Is it the judge's discretion? Yeah, I think so. They, they can they can rule well, I think what happens in in some of these cases is that they rule that the case isn't about facilitated communication it's about mm. sexual assault or or false allegations of abuse so they don't actually get into the whether FC is real or not I think they I think there's they they kind of go around that issue some some do some don't um, in my case the the guardian at Lightum called Howard Shane, and they set up the they set up the double blind testing before it went to court, uh, or when you know the case was seen. I think the the court was involved, but it wasn't a court case yet. They were just you know holding the person on suspicion, and um, so the the double blind testing happened before the the case actually went to court which is what happened um, it should happen on all of the cases because what happens is the like the police and in, in the Carla case and my case and all the other cases that I've looked at they they get into this protocol that has to be followed so so even if people around them are saying this can't be true these facts are not the facts that are coming out through facilitated communication aren't real they'll they'll say yeah but we have an obligation to 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 see whether the abuse cases are, I mean, the, the abuse is real or not. Now in, in Carla's case, and in the case of the person that I was working with, there was no physical evidence of, of sexual abuse. And so that also should have played a part in, in um, um, having them drop the charges, but it took a, it took a, a long time for it to get through the, the court case. Um, and they, they, the court in this case actually did um, come out on the side of Carla and her family, and they admonished the the um, 
Rosemary Crosley and her facilitators for promoting this without, they said, you know, the one thing that could have stopped all this was the double blind test thing. I mean, I'm using those words, it, it's, the, they may be different. That's what they meant. Um, and and as, as I use this case because, um, not only did they not implement double blind testing in their guidelines after Rosemary Crosley and her facilitators went through the same thing, they um, chose to ignore that and they continue to, to use facilitated communication and they continue to not test it when, when issues come up. You know, they, they stand behind the facilitated messages. Um, well, so now I have a question. Yeah. Um, I'm going to get this in before somebody else grabs this question. When in the most of the cases that you've looked at, the parent was okay with facilitated be communication before the allegations were made. You know, it was all right when it was all sunshine and flowers and puppies, and and she's telling you what she wants for dinner and she's writing poetry and and she's saying how much she loves you and everything. But once the allegations are made, and the parent obviously knows that it's not true because they're they were there. Um, do the parents believe that it's a bad facilitator and they resume facilitating after the if, after the event um, after the court case, or do they say, "I didn't realize that the facilitator was influencing all this, and obviously it was all made up, and this facilitated or RPM is all garbage." Or is there somewhere in between? Um, I think that it's somewhere in between. I think the, the um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think facilitated communication was dropped by the family that I worked with, but they had a facilitator that wasn't me that still believed in facilitated communication after the testing. She believed that if she had been tested, the results would have been different. Oh, she, um, she felt it was you. Yeah, um, yeah. I know in the the um, there was a similar case to mine in um, around 2012 called the Wheaton case, and I believe that family dropped. They believed in it, went through the court, and they they ended up dropping it afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, there's a there's another case in New Hampshire that happened around the same time that um, that uh, they were on the Prisoners of Silence as well. And I believe they stopped using facilitated communication. So I I think that um, my gut feeling is that the the families that are hurt by this generally stop using facilitated communication, but the facilitators don't necessarily stop using facilitated communication. So Linda Rosa has a question: What can be accepted as testimony in court? And then she answers: It depends on what standards for expert testimony a case has adopted. Some states have adopted the federal guidelines, which are called the Daubert standards, D-A-U-B-E-R-T. These require an expert only give well-established and reliable scientific evidence to a jury. Other states have FRI standards, F-R-Y-E standards, which are loosey-goosey. Mere general acceptance in a field is good enough. This allows for junk science in the courtroom. Yeah, so that's that's the judge's discretion. Does a... Does a um, a or person that's about the same Brian Gorman that that has written about um, FC in the court in the courts, and I, we're hoping to talk to him, so mm -hmm. maybe we can ask him that question. I'm not I'm not as up on the. I I know that the, there have been, like Linda's suggesting, is that there have been cases where the judge decides one way or the other, mm -hmm. um, and and I I think there's complications. Um, for both of them. Okay, are you ready for me to move on with the um, I think we're done. Oh, the other thing I wanted to just mention about um, two things. The, there was a expert psychologist that, that um, testified at the Carla case and he said, quote, facilitated communication is based on a system of belief. If you have the belief and have the knowledge of the words communication, occurs and he agreed with one suggestion that it was bizarre and hysterical. So that was in 1992 that, that people were saying this and it's still true today. And the other thing I wanted to mention was at the time, 
Crosley had worked with about 900 people using wow. FC. Now she is still using FC. So oh, um, people, have, people have asked, you know, how many people use FC? Yeah, I don't, if we, if you use that as a guideline, now I think FC has dropped in popularity then in the early 90s, but if, if she was working with about 900 people then using FC, then only multiply those numbers because she hasn't, she hasn't, she's actually deeper in her belief system than she was in 1990 because they, she's one of, and the other promoters of this are um, like proud of themselves that they have um, survived 30 years of all this criticism and they're still going strong. So um, she's even stronger in her belief system than she was. Yeah, how then. would you admit that this was all a lie and I ruined all these lives? And, and we have to, you know, we, we stopping and saying, okay, well, it was found that the child was not abused by the father or the brother or whatever, but there's a lot that's going on in behind the scenes. I mean, this rips apart families, it rips apart um, the, the wife is thinking, could my husband have been a, a, capable of doing this? I mean, this could rip apart their marriage. It could, the child has been accused, the younger brother in some cases, or older brother has been accused of also uh, um, molesting their sister, other family members as well. Uh, and then you've got all those people on the outside who don't really know what's going on. All they know is that guy next door is accused of raping his daughter. Mm -hmm. Where there's smoke, there must be fire therefore he's a child molester therefore he's and you know the stigma of getting over something like that that you can't how in the heck do you say it? you know like take out billboard saying my daughter facilitated communication was you know, and, and it was all a lie and it was i mean mm -hmm. it ruins their lives or at least follows them for years yeah it's Even not just a harmless oh let's prove that it's not true okay let's all move on with our lives oh the cat's sitting on the keyboard don't sit on the keyboard any <laughs> My, my computer went, Ping! Yeah. Even in my case, I think I'm the only facilitator with abuse allegations involvement um, has come out and said, sorry, you know, and, and so even with that, even with, oh, we stopped FC in the school system where I worked and, you know, apologized to the family and stuff. And even, even with that and went public on TV um, saying, you know, this family needs to be cleared of these um accusations that that still there's still lingering doubts you know because people just believe the the initial um yeah, they don't know all of the all the yeah stuff. and and yeah. but as i keep explaining to janice every time she does one of these videos every time she writes an article every time she speaks out she's clearing that name of that person even if you're not naming them it it's you're explaining how it could happen. You're explaining, you know, on and on. So it, it, it's clearing them. It's, it's, you know, maybe not, you know, a billboard somewhere, but it's close. Oh, and here comes a whole bunch of comments. Uh, Deborah HR, allegations of abuse via SC still haunt innocent victims like the scarlet letter, sometimes even the parents, because most people are ill-informed about the junk science. As I just said, yeah, absolutely. As long as yeah. we speak out and make this, you know, somebody might right now be watching this going, oh, there was this kid in school that I thought her dad had been abusing. I, now I realize that maybe that wasn't true. And here I've been mean to them all this well, time. The thing with the abuse allegation cases is they get a lot of coverage mm -hmm. and then it goes away. You don't hear what, you don't hear what happens afterwards. And the, and the, I, th I would say one, one criticism, it's better, it's better now because um, um, I think some of, some of these people who have been involved with the, the um, double blind testing and stuff, um, and I'm in contact with and they've learned, we've learned from each other's stories with FC, but there, I, I don't think there's enough um, support for facilitators when they go through this to help them go beyond. I mean, I, I don't know whether it was, I mean, it was just, pure luck really you know i mean i had a i had a desire to figure out what happened and why so that kept the, the conversation going but but in some ways just by chance that i met people that were critical thinkers and were and were willing to spend the time with me to figure out what happened and why and and i think we need to do that for facilitators when they're in this situation i think a lot of times 
especially early on. I think people are more aware of it now, but um, there's 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 more of a willingness to talk with facilitators about okay, you know, we understand this is difficult. Mm -hmm. If they're open, I mean, a lot of times they're not open to talking about it either. But um, you know, that I, I think that's. I would say for the 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 skeptic community, one thing that that. I mean, I've heard podcasts and I've heard them talking about my story and being kind of flip and critical about it. Like, how would anybody possibly think that? And it's sort of like, yeah, you're the skeptical community and you're pushing me away from talking about it. You know, it's just so, it's just because I'm so obstinate that I'm still here. But you know what I mean? It's I think we need to be as a as a critical uh, skeptic community. We need to be careful about the message that we're we're putting across as well as, same as the psychic communities as people well the paranormal community as a whole i mean you got people like kenny biddle who were who were firm believers in ghosts and believed that you could go and you could you could find a ghost with a you know some sort of device used for stud finding in the wall and we need these people to come out and say oh my gosh i had no idea embrace me you guys or help me explain this and and that way we can understand we can see the other side i mean i know i believed in all sorts of crazy things when i was growing up and i don't think there's any way anybody could come out of this as a facilitator and not google your name or not find your name and understand that there is somebody who's giving voice to this and well you would easily be able to work with them and yeah. talk to them and say here's what i think and you know they don't have to be public i mean they don't have no. to be Anna Spoyton. They could just be, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did this and now I understand how. Somebody else explained to me, uh, Mark Edward uh, and I were on a, a cruise in 2009 and a woman was on the cruise who had been a cold, had been cold reading and didn't realize she'd been cold reading all her friends and she saw crystals and she was really into it. She thought she was psychic. And then she saw an episode of something Mark had done explaining cold reading and she goes, oh my gosh yeah where it makes so much sense now but we can't push them away and i i don't think we should yeah we slightly do make fun of people but i think we should still kind of be like you know i could have been me i i think there's a difference between i don't know it's such an uncomfortable topic then that you have to have some levity and in, inside at sometimes but right. there's a difference between that and some of the the talks that i've heard that are really bordering on being really mean right and, and we also have to remember in your era we didn't have internet or ways to find it but if somebody came out right now and there was a sorry i was eating a gummy shark i'm <laughs> i could drink or i could eat bad stuff so i decided to eat bad stuff instead of having alcohol okay so because <laughs> Alcohol might make this a lot more fun, though. At least to watch. <laughs> Susan Drunk would be hilarious, I'm sure. But um, <laughs> where was I going with this? <laughs> I had a gummy shark. Um, Janet, you would say, in Mark Edward had oh 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 about we need to be kind to these people who are coming out because we need to be able to understand where they're coming from so we can learn from them and so on. And there was another really important point I was about to make. Oh, podcasting and people, um, how we make light of it and make fun of it. People now, like in 2020, if they're using facilitated communication, especially by the name facilitated communication in their schools and getting yeah. miracles where a child is uncommunicative and now is, I think they're, we've got a line now. They should have known because you can't not google these things it's and when you google you're gonna get the wikipedia page you're gonna find it is definitely real i mean it's if so if there's a court case now and they said well to the facilitator or to the school especially the ones we put on notice uh northern universe uh northern iowa where we were like you have been warned that this is pseudoscience here's a list of 30 experts or with PhDs that are telling you this is pseudoscience. So when you are now accused of um, 
training somebody and facilitated communication and blah, 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 you are going to have to suffer the repercussions because you know it's been made aware of you. And mm -hmm. so we'll have to talk that, about that another day, but that's where I'm at is when you put them on notice, they should know, you know, at that point, then go down the path of ridiculing them. I'm fine. Yeah. <laughs> any I'll questions half a glass of wine and susan is two sheets to the wind <laughs> <laughs> me too <laughs> yeah we're... especially since my surgery i can't uh, yeah i've never been good, tolerant of I, i'd just probably go to sleep um okay so so let me talk about now this one is really sad you guys okay you thought this is weird but I'll put this in the show notes too. This is a, a blog that I came across when I was researching facilitated communication maybe a year or so ago. And this is a sister, her name is Pamela Block and she's on Facebook, I was checking her out last night. She's an expert on, on disability now and she's got a, a degree in uh, disciplinary studies and so on. But her sister is using facilitated communication or at least was at the time this blog was written um, I think this all happened back in um, 2009 or something like that. I pulled up I pulled up an article and I think I pulled up the wrong one. And uh, this couple, and now they both have this, uh, Wikipedia pages, which I thought was not Wikipedia, Facebook pages, which I thought was interesting. Uh, the boy, I shouldn't call him the boy, the man with disabilities, his name is Jacob. He's got a college degree. And uh, his girlfriend, or now his ex-girlfriend, was Hope. That's her name is Hope. And she has, um, her and him met through going to conferences together. Now they're both using facilitated communication. So the idea was, what happens when two people fall in love using facilitated communication? They had the same facilitator too. Yeah, they had, for a large percentage of the time, they have the same facilitator. Yeah. They don't live in the same state. They're across borders from each other. And um, talk about it for a second, because I've got the wrong article in front of me and I thought I had the right one. So I want to just pull that yeah. up real quick because it's got some great quotes in it. So they were going to conferences and they were they were giving talks and they I think they're also giving, giving credit for um, writing a, a book or part of a book about um intimate relationships and people with disabilities so that that was the premise they were they were um they were sort of the rock stars of the of of that particular topic they were adorable couple apparently of course they never really interacted with each other <clears throat> they they were talking about the facilitators on this blog which is her sister and somebody else were talking about this and they wrote this really long article about um how what are we supposed to do now that my sister has fallen in love with this guy how are we going to date how are they going to date how are they going to um how are they going to have a life together get married um have a living raise children have relationships sexual relationships sexual relationships through with a facilitator present yeah because they can't communicate to each other well the i think one of them has some spoken ability but not much and the other one i, I think is is non-speaking and and both use facilitated communication and maybe a little bit of sign language i think i pulled up the wrong article. i think i pulled up the same article twice i'm just so excited to talk about this subject because i've been like what in the world what in the world so they they would like take them on the facilitators trying to decide what to do on dates with them so i think they took them to the mall at one point and set them on a bench together and then went and walked off to the facilitators went and walked and sat on the other side and just watched them interact which i don't think they were interacting um <laughs> oh oh there was a whole bunch of good stuff on here so they were saying that I'm not even sure I explain this. <laughs> okay, so she says her sister is saying that Hope is able to communicate 
but she needs assistance with her hand. She needs to have somebody holding her wrist, her arm, or her elbow. And uh, that's a preferred way to communicate. Um, and uh, she doesn't want to, what's it say? She, she, she's best able to communicate when she types, obviously. She says, this is from Hope, apparently. I don't see things like ordinary people, and it feels like I'm out of sync with the rest of the world. I am thought of as not very smart, but I am very intelligent. I am awesome at presenting at conferences, but I have trouble with conversations. I don't know why that is. It is odd that I have so much trouble talking to people one-on-one. -on -one. Please realize that it is me typing, not my mom. I cannot type yet without support. I'm perfectly capable of my own thoughts. She's saying through her mother, who is facilitating, that she can type, she can talk and and um, and explain things, but she really needs to have the support of typing. Mm -hmm. She independent, uh, independent with support at the elbow. And this was years. I mean, so she never did phase out apparently. Um, and they talk about Jacob, her boyfriend. Jacob prefers to have his hand tightly grasped to provide input. He's capable of isolating his own index finger, crossing midline, hitting a letter target accurately, and performing many of the other skills required for supported typing with a hand tourniqueting his shirt above the elbow. He corrects misspellings with his non-typing hand too. So Jacob says, without FC, I would be a lost soul. Now listen to how eloquent these are. I yearn to be able to type with anyone so everyone can know the depth of my thinking, my spirituality, my feelings, my understanding, and so many other sides of my complex self that one can't possibly know without typing with me. Typing does not change the fact that I am and will always be autistic. That is because of the severity of my autism. I will always flunk the standardized tests that leave me to be eligible for services provided only to those with an intellectual disability. Nevertheless, my inability to pass those tests has to do with performance barriers, the same ones that make fluent and meaningful or language possible. So the, they, they started dating in late 2009, dating. Uh, they became engaged in May of 2010, and their first date consisted of sitting without support at a table in an ex exhibition hall at a conference and just being, B-E-I-N-G, just being, in quotes. On their next day, in early January of 2010, Hope's staff uh, uh, began suggesting things they could do in the area. Um, and I guess Jacob said, oh, Hope typed, why do you neuro neurotypical people always have to do something? Why can't you just be? In other words, she's, she's suggesting she just wants to sit with him. Why do we have to talk? Why do we have to go anywhere? Well, that would make it easy for the facilitators. <laughs> So, um, uh, so, so they're talking about how they wanted to just lay next to each other and just look into each other's eyes. Well, okay. And then also they were talking about how he wanted, they didn't want, I guess, a sexual relationship where they weren't really sure. And that Jacob wanted to move in with Hope, but because of her religious beliefs, they couldn't live together in sin, I guess. I know it sounds like I'm really making fun of these people, but I am just like, okay, in, in their mind, they believe that they are communicating and they're totally there and they're just locked in. To myself, I'm looking at this as, oh no, they're, <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, Janice, give us some words while I, while I. I don't know, if, if he can, if they can cross midline, which is, which is, you know, moving your hand across. The, the center of your body he's good and they can he can isolate a finger and he can wow. make that movement he can isolate a finger he's got the motor skills to type on his own in, independently that's one that's one thing um the the other thing that that that's disconcerting i mean there's tons of things that are disconcerting but what the fc proponents are doing like the this particular book that they wrote or articles that they wrote that talk about people with autism in particular with um in terms of of um 
real life kind of issues that need to be talked about with people with disabilities and they're all of this is done through facilitated communication then they're just projecting the facilitators views on onto you know like sexual relationships with people with disabilities or medical issues or religious issues or or whatever the topic is and and they they are in some ways changing the course of the conversation because these are treated as legitimate by some people um, in the in the education community and proponents in particular and real actually um, how people with autism think and how people with autism um, feel about these issues you know that it's not really uh, I don't I don't think it's an uh, they may maybe they think exactly what's been written on the page but we don't know that because it's not coming from the exactly. person with disabilities it's coming from the there's there's a lot of concerns the other thing is uh, I wouldn't want to be a facilitator <laughs> facilitating somebody while they were having sexual relations with someone else. I mean, that, ew, I, <laughs> you know, like, it, it, especially if they don't have- There's a whole genre of people who would find that really- Like, you, you've got consent issues, you've got, like, it, I don't, I don't, it, would that be a felony? I mean, I don't know. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I just don't. How could a judge even allow them to marry? I mean, could you go to a courthouse and say, "She's typing. She wants to. I, she wants to marry them." Again, yeah. as I said, I know that the people who believe in facilitating communication are the sister, who's still into this. I guess I'm sure they're going to come back and attack me for making fun of people with disabilities. And of course, people with disabilities want to have sexual relationships and want to have long term relationships and have children. And I'm not saying that. I'm saying exactly that in this case, these people do not have, have never proved competency beyond, well, any other isolating a finger. So yeah, he's got a college degree. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that he got it. He right. Can't, if he can isolate a finger, he can type by himself with nobody in the room, obviously. And okay, here's, here's what they're saying. This is the final thoughts of this article, this blog written by the sister and all. Like I said, I'll put it up in the show notes somewhere. At the moment, intimacy for both Hope and Jacob involves facilitating communication, let each other know how much they love each other and why. They also discuss their futures, their current lives, like college courses that they both took recently. And like any other couple may complain to each other about the slowness of a wait at a restaurant. Remember, this is the same facilitator in a lot of these cases doing the facilitating, I guess. Neither has expressed any interest in physical contact except for an occasional kiss on the cheek or hug. They often choose to sit near but not next to each other. Yet, as they communicate from their hearts, it is challenging for those supporting them to be a fly on the wall and to rise above feeling like a voyeur so as not to convey personal discomfort to Hope or Jacob that may limit their freedom of expression. Without support from others, such communication on their parts would be impossible. Ooh, it says, given greater levels of intimacy, particularly in the sexual area, comprise bridges that both Hope and Jacob and their families and members of their support teams may have to cross eventually. So how to handle this if, if they were to marry and so on? Well, we talked, we were talking about this yesterday and apparently they've broken up because it was too difficult. Distant, because of distance, right? The, dis, the, the, the logistics of it, of the, cause one was in a different, one had moved, I think. And so they- They, they should be able to get married. And, okay, let's go back to this, almost the first video we did, I said, you have people who are competent. They can vote, they can get married, they can open a checking account, they can make decisions. There's no court that's gonna come in over their head and say, oh no, you can't do that. You aren't competent. You know, People in vegetated states in the hospital, if they're in there for a certain amount of time, they can't vote. They can't make decisions for their health and medications or get married to somebody while they're in a coma or something like that. There are, there are different worlds here and in this case, 
are these people competent? Are they paying taxes? You know, do they fill out their own W-2, uh, their own taxes? Do they vote or can they vote? Can they register to vote? Can they make legal decisions? If their parents were to have a health emergency, could these people go and help make decisions about their parents' health? Can they open a checking account? If you can't pass that, that, that line, then you're probably not competent enough to, to have a child, to get married, to make decisions about future life, to give consent for a sex. Yeah. These are my thoughts. Not your Genesis. These are just my thoughts. And I find it, but we would be completely villain, villainized by this community for the stuff I just said, because of course I'm, anti disability people with disabilities yeah yeah i mean there there needs to be an independent way of them to communicate what they do know maybe they they maybe they do understand all that um but they need to they need to um be able to have those conversations without the facilitator present it, it needs Deborah, to be. Deborah just suggested if they can look into each other's eyes, they could be using eye gaze independently and assessing language without the sister present. Yeah, that's true. Oh, there's, there's, yeah, that's true. That's um, there's a there's techno not the eye gazing that we talked about last week where they use RPM and eye gazing equipment, but there's actually equipment where the um, there's a like a. I don't know how it works exactly what a laser or something that that communicates with like Wi-Fi I would imagine that communicates with the the communication device and you you look at a letter and it types that letter for you so you don't you don't need a facilitator at all if you have if you're eight like Deborah was saying if you have the ability to um, to track you know you, you have the muscles that allow your your eyes to move back and forth and you can focus on a letter and and determine what that letter is then you have the ability there's technology now that allows you infrared. to infrared say that again infrared. infrared yeah yeah and it's true you would be able to and it's all different for each person with the disabilities like stephen hawking he used a different kind of uh uh, communication device, and I think it changed as he became more and more de de um, dis disabled from being able to communicate. They can they can communicate with an eye twitch. They can communicate. I mean, that is if they're locked in and they can't move, or they can move but they can't move it without. Um, they can move but they can't move without somebody uh, deliberately. Like they wouldn't be able to type. They wouldn't be able to reach out and type. Uh, There's a true physical impairment. Yeah, yeah. They can, but they yeah. can still communicate because they can blink or they can blow into a straw. Or they can twitch a muscle. Mm -hmm. That's all it takes. There, you know, maybe maybe what we need to be talking about is the community's access to that equipment because not everybody has access, and so that leaves the door open for something like FC that's inexpensive, and you could just have to photocopy a, a letter board and you're good to go, right? So, you know, the, the, there may be an issue with access, but that's different than ability, like a person's ability to communicate independently. We also need to hold people accountable for, for messing with the word independence. To me, independence means by yourself. It doesn't mean independent with the help of somebody touching your hand it, that, 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 or with the help of somebody independent but i'm holding the keyboard i've heard that too oh they typed it out independently but i was holding the keyboard what the hell if you know if somebody's doing it independently you don't need them to hold the keyboard for you and you probably don't even need to be in the room you probably don't even need you to be, in the be room. able to not be in the room right right you know, i mean obviously if you're having a conversation with somebody they want to tell you something but right uh yeah okay so move on to another case study your turn this time okay um, one of the one of the um, cases that brought me back into the talk about facilitated communication because after my case there were years that I just didn't want to deal with it at all. Um, I got a phone call in 2012 from a, a reporter that said, um, "Does do you know about the Wendro case? And we're going to be talking about your case whether you comment or not." So I was like, "Oh, okay." Which case was this? 2012 
there was the 2020 the Wendro case. It's called W E N D R O W. And D R O W in West Bloomfield, Michigan. Yeah. So the the person was 14 year, years old with severe autism, and she was non nonverbal. There were rape allegations against her father, the and also the mother was. Um, complicit because she didn't intervene and then the 13 year old brother was also implicated so for me that was devastating to hear because it was very similar to the case that I was involved in um, the father was jailed for over 80 days before the charges were dropped 80 I think days. It, yeah 80 days I think I think it actually was pushed closer to a hundred um, the father was jailed on first-degree criminal sexual conduct and child abuse the mother was charged with child abuse and witness intimidation, and she had to wear an electronic tether during this time. Um, they actually, in the courtroom, they isolated the the facilitator, and um, so they the the facilitator couldn't answer the couldn't hear what the questions were. Mm -hmm. and the, she couldn't answer what color is your sweater, or are you a boy or a girl. And the, the proponents um, in the case said she was too stressed to answer correctly. Too stressed. Yeah. Um, there was also there was also problems with the testimony. This this comes up over and over again in the 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 police. We need to educate police and lawyers better to to look at some of these um, cues. The the supposedly through FC the. Um, Family had visited the rabbi's house and testified that the the um, the girl um, accused her, reiterated the accusations. He, they never visited the rabbi. Testified they never visited her house. There was also um, um, a statement that the girl feared she was going to hell for lying, but her family was Jewish and didn't believe in eternal damnation. And also that um, the girl feared her father um, who kept fire guns in the house and the police raided the home and found no weapons in the home. So like none of it, it all fell apart in court. They, they eventually got a $1.8 million settlement against the police department, but um, the statement was made, nothing more than a business decision by the insurance company to settle with no admission of wrongdoing or liability. In the meantime, so going to follow the family and the husband around for. Yeah, I, I believe, I believe days, they had to move. Almost 100 days in jail. Yeah. I'm sure he would happily have given up this $1.8 million settlement that a lot of it probably went to lawyers anyway, to not have this happen to them. Yeah. Yeah. He, um, uh, no, I won't say it. It's, that's anecdotal. I believe well I believe that I, I believe that they dropped the um, facilitated communicate they believed in facilitated communication at first and then dropped it but I think that I think that there was some sadness because the what happens with FC the um, uh, the the we've seen this in other articles too so um, where the facilitators the parents are all of a sudden treating the person with disabilities differently like the instead of a seeing them as a six-year-old they start treating or a, a, a 12 year old they start treating them like they would somebody in college or whatever you know what i mean they 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 shift their emotional thinking about the person through fc because they think that they can interact with them on a, in a on a um a higher intellectual level well they're and communicating so that, at a higher level because the person who's the facilitator has more right. vocabulary and right. more Skill. Right. So if if the person goes from um, <clears throat> no communication to typing out poetry and and writing a book or a play or whatever, then then you're going to treat them like you can't help but treat them a little bit differently than if you think that they're nonverbal. Absolutely. Unfortunately, I mean, I think I think the if you take away FC, you can t still treat somebody who's nonverbal with as if they had higher intellectual skills, you just have to, I don't know how to say the word this very, very well, but you know, you can treat somebody with respect and give them um, 
a lot of room in terms of their potential and stuff and support them without using facilitated communication. That's, that's. So I'm going to go to, because these are interesting, but we'll, I want to get through a few more. This is a case that happened in 2007, 2008. And um, it was written about by Brian Dickerson of the Detroit Free Press. And he did a really phenomenal job, which is we got to get these stories out into the media so that people can, you know, get into, the, into the, the, the world of people who were not necessarily paying attention to this kind of thing. Um, apparent, yeah, it was January 29th, 2008. A uh, West Bloomfield couple in Detroit, I guess, Oakland, Oakland, um, Oakland West County. Bloomfield, that was, that was, was that the Wendro case? I thought that was the Wendro case. Is that the one you just talked about? Is there another one in Colorado? Name. It says, um, the, the facilitator's name is Sandra McClellan. Is that the same one? I don't know. Because all I did was, was reading this this article written by Brian Dickerson, and he's talking about that the person who, uh, it's a 14 year old daughter communicating on a typewriter with assistance of a teacher's aide, had some horrifying allegations against her parents. The facilitators. Oh, the. I think that's the same one. You think so? Yeah. It sort of sounded like it, but it was they were they were talking about it. They said that she'd never been very good at accurately conveying information about the two past events. Now, what the court case, according to this newspaper article, is, is they were they were blaming on the little girl, the 14-year-old, for not continuing with the allegation. She shut up and she didn't answer. And um, <laughs> where they're saying is, you know, she probably didn't answer because she can't facilitate. And also the um, uh, the the they asked her some questions of court. Yeah, this might be the same one. They were asking her some questions like, what color is your sweater? And her answer was J-I-B-H-J-Y-I-H. That was her answer. Yeah. And then they said, they asked her, what are you holding in your hand right now? And her answer was, I am 14. <laughs> and, okay, so this is, sounds like the same one, but they it's don't similar. use her name yeah. in here. So I thought it was a different, I thought it was a different case. But it said that um, they went back and they they went back and they were talking to a person who had uh, Z W I E B E L Z Z Z B L. They went back and they interviewed this guy named Alan Zybel, civil rights lawyer whose legal uh, crusade against FC communicated cumulant cumulant. It was a 1997 case that had $750,000 to a New York couple who had lost custody of their daughter. So he, they, they interviewed him for this newspaper article. He's like, you got to be kidding me. My God, I thought we struck a stake in through its heart in 1997. Yeah. facilitated communication. I actually talked with him. Oh, yeah? Yeah, early yeah. on. He wanted to do a, he wanted to do a, um, what, a class action lawsuit early on but i was i wasn't in a, in a position where i understood what was going on and i didn't i backed out of it but he um he was in he was active in in the early in the early 90s as well i think he's retired now but yeah so i'm gonna have to go back and clean up the wikipedia page now a little bit because i think i have i think i put this because because there was no online link to what happened in this case of this New York um, oh. $50,000 claim by this Allen uh, civil rights lawyer. But now I see, and I found the newspaper clipping on newspapers.com and added it. So I got to kind of clean this up a little bit because I was, I was getting a little confused because Oakland is a city close to me. So I was thinking it was Oakland, California. Uh. Then now I see it's Oakland County, but where is Oakland County? Is that New York? There was a case. There was a case Why in New York, but I don't, I'm not real familiar with that one. And then there was the Wendro case. So I have to go back and look at the dates and see. I think it might be the same. And they don't have the they don't have the person's name in here, so it's confusing. Oh, here's one of the things they said. The reporter. I thought this was fascinating. No. Okay. So they interviewed. Oh, and they interviewed James Todd, friend of ours, Jim Todd, who we will be talking about. 
uh, who will be on one of our, one of our talks here soon. So um, the prosecutor, they interviewed the prosecutor in this case, and she said no one in our office had ever heard of facilitated communication. And the girl's parents believed the controversial method, which proponents call FC, had locked their speechless daughter's inner voice. Ironically, it was the parents, I have to move around here to find it, faith in FC that convinced the facilitators the girl's facilitated accus accusations were authentic. And it says, if police and prosecutors had Googled the phrase facilitated communication, as the reporter did, when they first heard about the case, they would have learned that most educators and autism experts had long ago lost faith in FC and that researchers had repeatedly failed to establish its legitimacy in controlled experiments. It's a really great article. So I got to make sure I get this correctly linked on Wikipedia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to just, uh, but you know, it, it is confusing, like I say, because they don't say anybody's names. They don't say a, a last name or anything like that. They're very careful. So it was kind of confusing. Yeah. That's that. That's the hard part about tracking how many of these cases uh, have actually happened because they don't always make it to the press. They sometimes change the names of the the people, and so, um, sometimes these are uh, settled um, before they get to court. So they, oh, yeah, they don't always. Oh yeah, that's telling us. Is that yeah, your accusations made, and then it's settled out of court, and you never hear what ended up happening with it. Yeah, so it's hard to track exactly how many. Okay, you go for. Or when I'm going to do, um, I have another one here I'm going to do in a minute. Go ahead. Are you going to do the Florida one? Did or you, do you want me to? to? Yeah. Okay, but go ahead. You, you Is that what you were going to do? Yeah, I was one of, a, one of the ones I was going to do. Oh, that's what I had that. Um, oh, I wanted to talk about just real quick. Um, an interesting case, too. What's that? The Yeah. Um, Anna Stubblefield was uh um talk about uh, Anna Stubblefield. Everybody sit back and watch. This is great. Get your popcorn. Well it's not great. Or it's horrible. But Anna Stubblefield was a ethics um edu professor at Rutgers University and she was really big into facilitated communication. I believe still is. I think they they supported they continue to support her despite the fact that she was approached by um a family who had a young man uh, adult um who was disabled, the, the brother heard Stubblefield talking um, about facilitated communication and asked if they could work together and she did it pro bono and she ended up believing that she um, was in love with the, with the client and through facilitated communication proceeded to have sexual, uh, proceeded to get consent according to her and um had sexual relationships and then she told the family that that this was their, their relationship had changed um and she was she was married she was willing she was all ready to to leave her husband and stuff um for for this new love interest that she had and um they the family broke off contact with her but she kind of pursued them and tried to get contact with the with the young man um his name and is dj or cj or dj is the is the is what they used in the newspapers mm -hmm. and um she was convicted on two counts of first degree aggravated sexual assault for um physically for of a physically inc incapacitated young man um and she they she later she later pled guilty to a third degree sexual assault in a plea deal. So she, she's not serving jail time anymore. She's the, she pled, she pled to a different guilty to a different charge, but she was still convicted on the, on first degree, um, aggravated sexual she had assault. Sex with him. She was trying to have sex yeah. with him. They were trying to have, I don't know, can't word this because obviously he wasn't consenting. So she was, she thought she was having sex with him intercourse. But of course he didn't know what was going on. So she said they had to work at it for a while on the floor of her office, I think she said. And then the next time she was able to, to something was able to happen, I think. He's, I mean, he's, he's uh, in diapers. Yeah. Uh, his, his family said that when she told him, 
<laughs> she told him we're in love. We're going to, I'm going to leave my husband and my kids and, and be with DJ or CJ. They're like, you're daft lady. You know, he's, he's, he's like a toddler, but the size of a person, uh, an adult or a teenager. I think he could, he could indicate that, that like he, he wanted something or that he was upset or happy or whatever, but he didn't have, he didn't have functional language skills, spoken language skills or He's written language skills. She's a professor. Of ethic. Ethic, yeah. Ethics professor. Yeah. And she, so they, she, they, um, the said, we're not, we're not, no, facilitated communication. No. They didn't, they didn't. Um, they didn't allow facilitated. That's, that's partly why she got a new trial was the, the first judge didn't allow them to make a ruling on whether facilitated communication was legitimate or not. He said the, the issue wasn't about facilitated communication. It was about the sexual relationship. And so they had to kind of, uh, my, I, I, I haven't looked a lot. This case is particularly upsetting to me, so I didn't. I haven't actually um, looked deeply into this particular case. There's other people that that have, and maybe we can talk to them about it. But um, my understanding is that 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 um, that's that's on her side. She's claiming that because they didn't allow him to use facilitated communication in the courtroom or um, as part of a testimony or whatever that that it wasn't the case wasn't fair and so I there was enough doubt that, yeah. yeah so they got a new they got a new trial um and i i believe that the fc community is still um backing can you believe they still for. back this so i mean is it rape is it still rape if a person believes that they really did get consent and i right. think that's, the answer is the court has said there was no consent that's the question that's the question and so in people, their mind the the believers they believe that she got consent or she and, truly believed she had consent yeah and that she loved him and so that wasn't therefore it wasn't sexual assault or rape or whatever this is just I, my yeah i problematic all the way through and, and a teacher yeah. and a student that's another thing a teacher student was he was he of age i mean if he could have consented was he over 18 yeah he was an adult he was yeah an, okay he was an adult but there's still a differential there's a power differential there Parent, yeah a professor that is your she was hired she was hired not hired but she agreed to work with him as a as a professor client or you know a, a professional client relationship and so there's there's issues around boundaries around that as well. And she was taking him to on conferences. She wanted to have him like to be a spokesperson for the. I think she took him, or she was going to take him, out of state. I can't remember now, but the family was like, "No, you're not taking him anywhere." I think that's what was going. On. Yeah, they're like yeah. they were clear. It was the mother and her and her son were the were the uh, advocates for uh dj yeah and they saw they i don't think they had a lot of credence in facilitated communication because i knew this child was not dj was not had sudden language and sudden you know uh poetry and, and they knew right. that this wasn't happening and they said that the guy that to have this happen you know i guess they were just kind of going along with it that this this uh woman this professor is really giving a lot of attention to my younger brother and my or my son and they're like, I don't okay, think well, they realize yeah they didn't they obviously didn't realize to the extent to what the communicating was you know yeah and when it came down to it they were like oh no i don't <laughs> i don't think so and it's just oh, it's, it's a mess because as you said the believers in facilitated communication are still some of them are still supporting anna stubbefield yeah and that that's one case where i i don't i don't believe that her belief in fc is is shaken in any way whatsoever i think she how could you yeah you want to think that you what you did wasn't rape and i think her daughter still teaches fc is that right anna's daughter is or is it her mom still i think her mom her mom was involved with it yeah i think they're still very involved in it 
that was yeah yeah it's it's crazy to me that that people's belief system like what do you what can you do to to shake somebody who's that involved with it to shake their belief system i don't know that you can reach them you know if they're if they're not even questioning the situation um after that kind of experience and i don't know how you could possibly reach them and uh deborah makes a point on here it, okay so in this case of anna stubblefield she's a a a, a woman of privilege white woman with a, a PhD, she's a professor of ethics at, a, at an esteemed college, uh, Rutgers, Rutgers, Rutgers University, mm -hmm. and the person she's facilitating is a uh, black male who has no, um, who's severely disabled physically as well as mentally. <laughs> um, he's unable to walk. He's mm -hmm. he puts on the floor. I think something like that. And um, not saying that that isn't a person who could not be a lovely person to marry someday, but I'm saying in this case, he is not consenting to anything. And um, she's, and Deborah in the comments is, if you turn that around, if it was a black man who raped a disabled white woman, and she's like, how could the, how could the FC community still, still um, back this woman up? And it's because they didn't allow facilitated communication in. Well, they, they also changed, they, they were calling it facilitated communication at first, and then now they're saying, well, it wasn't facilitated communication, it was supported typing. And so, it, yeah, so they're, in their heads, they're, they, because FC is known by a hundred different names, um, they just switch. It wasn't FC. We know we know FC is bad. It was supported typing or rapid prompting method or whatever else they want to call it yeah i'm telling you these are very awkward awkward discussions janice and i are discussing these case studies are very awkward do you want me to do jose um yeah hi hi leah i guess that's how you yeah. say it. so this is a new one 2018. this happened in florida in um dade county where is that miami dade county where they're having all the outbreaks of the uh of the the coronavirus right now it's really 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 awful right now so this is 2018 uh, apparently um his son was is really is uh, is autistic and in the school they were teaching him um, uh, they were communicating with his seven-year-old son using a method called um hand over yeah hand over hand hand over hand and the person who was doing the facilitating was someone who had not been trained in facilitating communication he and apparently the school wasn't really using it but for some reason this facilitator was using this method and um the facilitator said that the seven-year-old child had said which isn't true that his father was abusing him so they took the child from his father and from the household the father was absolutely clueless what was going on threw the man in jail again possibly because he's a man of color that's my opinion again he's a hispanic man jose cordello Cord Cord cordero possibly they threw him in jail in jail removed his child from him and um it's a prosecutor's grew suspicious when through the facilitator the boy made even more outlandish claims and language not typical for seven for someone of the seven-year-old age after being paired with a different teacher and a specialist, the child was no longer able to re reproduce a single world, word. And then coupled with negative DNA testing, I don't know what that was about, the charges were eventually dropped. Due to significant inconsistencies with the victim's disclosures, coupled with controversy, controversial means by which the disclosure, disclosure was obtained, and a lack of corroborating witnesses, the state was unable to prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt at this time. Uh, the, the guy that they interviewed, the guy who's a facilitator, his name is Saul uh, Fumo, Fumuro. You know, I could never be one of those news readers where they have the, the teleprompter going and I, I would just, there's a job I would fail at. Uh, <laughs> even if art. I practiced the, saying the names. It's so he said that he had no formal training in FC. And uh, this was 2018. Again, 
I do blame the facilitator in this case. He should have known that there was something wrong with this method he was using. And, and I think he should have done a quick Google search or something. Cause that to me is like, come on now. So even if, even if he had been trained though, it's still the, the it's still a bogus technique. So, you know, like uh, the, the messaging of FC is that it's easy to use, you know, or hand over hand is really simple to use. And they, they have guidelines like, um, be supportive, you know, be open-minded, um, you know, whatever, use information, like close exercises or multiple choice to make sure that the, the student can to answer the questions and it's all based on what the facilitator knows. And so if you read, if you read about hand over hand, especially if you don't know that that's another name for facilitated communication, I mean, it, hand over hand is one of those tricky ones because you can, you can use hand over hand for a minute or two to, to help somebody form letters when they're learning to write or whatever, but you know, you got to let go, <laughs> you know, right? So hand over hand is one of those, you know, uh, he can talk himself into, well, this is a new technique. I'll just try it and find out what happens. And so that's part of, that's a branding, that's a branding problem. If you don't know supported typing or spelling to communicate or hand over hand, or if those aren't red flags for you, then you might not equate it with facilitated communication. I'm not sticking up for the person. Well, which is why we have that on the Wikipedia page, as well as this guy's case. We've made sure it's in, in a Wikipedia page. This Wikipedia page is called, we had to remove a whole bunch of these case studies from the Wikipedia page for facilitated communication because there were so many. And now it's a separate Wikipedia article called list of abuse allegations made through facilitated communication. And so now, because like you said, these make the news and then people go, whatever happened to that? Yeah. That, oh, maybe they couldn't prove the case, but maybe he's still guilty. So this yeah. would haunt this guy for, for years, if not longer, ruin his, his, uh, his, his relationships with other people, maybe even the ability. I believe to he lost his job. He was, he was away from his family for a period of time. That's and it was his, horrible. Yeah. His whole yeah. family. Is, I mean, can you imagine what his mom is thinking? Jeez. And so I well, mean, the other thing, the other thing, I don't know if you picked up on this, but the teacher also claimed that the mother, the boy's mother was involved and that his sister had been conditioned to be a sex slave. So that also, I didn't hear that part. So that also affects the mom and the, and the sister, you know, that's a horrible thing to, to grow up and learn, uh, learn about, you know, yeah. I also I forgot to mention that Anna Anna Stubblefield was trained through Syracuse University, so she wasn't one of those bad facilitators. She was the one that she was one that was trained through through Syracuse University. So we got um, it's one thirty right now, but I, I I don't know. What do you want to do? Do you want to do a couple more and then I've got one more. Okay, okay. good. So what are you gonna do? GG. Okay, I do GG, and then let's call it a day only because I can't imagine. Well, this is a lot. You do another day of just abuse. Yeah. So um, Gigi Jordan was a mom of a eight-year-old son who had aut. He was he was non-speaking and autistic, and she believed through facilitated communication. I don't know where she was trained, but she was using facilitated communication that her son had been abused by the father. Maybe, and I read one article that maybe she she thought both she had she was um estranged from one and divorced from the other i think mm -hmm. um I that both of them had were going to abuse the child or were abusing the child and he purportedly typed out that he wanted to die um this is one of the quotes in the newspaper i need to be dead i need a lot of drugs to die peacefully that's all we're going to die anyway let's do it ourselves so supposedly he convinced her to to get the drugs and to to do a murder suicide kind of thing she she lived but he um she gave the drugs to him. And with bruises on his face and chest to indicate that he actually was force fed these that he didn't go quiet he didn't it wasn't a peaceful death for for the boy um she saw it as a mercy killing and she she actually showed no remorse for her actions um the only thing that she had to say about it was that she would have done a better job um, at making sure that she had died too. So that was the only thing that she, um, she was convicted of manslaughter. And this was, um, 
this was uh ties to the skeptic community a little bit because a friend of uh, a friend of mine somebody that people may have met before her name is beth she's a nurse here in in the santa cruz area the monterey bay area sort of and she said that she went to school with Gigi jordan a nursing school and years later she said to herself oh i wonder what happened to Gigi gordon i don't know maybe she ran across a photo of her and, and she googled her and found this case and said oh my goodness i yeah. never have thought this person was capable of this she's just a just a fun you know student that i went to college with in the nursing program and so part of the you know i don't know where it turned but it she believed her, it says her second ex-husband who is a pharmaceutical executive was stealing millions of dollars from her and wanted her killed so uh that was another reason why she said that she should um, she should end her life and her son's life is because it would have been, you know, instead of waiting for her ex-husband to come after her to kill her. But part of the reason why, um, I don't know how, it, it, she wanted to, they say she didn't really want to die because she was a nurse and she should have known how much medication to take to kill herself. And um, she obviously uh -huh. force fed her son. So they're saying she just attempted to kill herself knowing not giving herself enough drugs to kill herself because they knew that she would uh have um survived hmm. interesting so that was another thing so she's in jail i actually have another one i want to i want to talk about really quick okay. so everybody else can hang on hang on a little bit more paula lawrence paul linda said that she's really enjoying these that we're going over these cases it gets info for people to research and she just put the link up in the uh facebook feed and hopefully we'll put that on the show notes when we when we put, make this live on YouTube, uh, where we're getting a lot of these case studies. And you can follow the links in there. And Deborah has uh, Deborah HR has just put up another uh, a slate article about the pseudoscience preys on people with disabilities and is, and is infiltrating schools. Oh, so um, this case I wanted to talk about. This is in Australia. Let me make sure I have the year correct. In Australia. 2011 i think so this is a woman is like anna stubblefield who was um she was at the sunshine coast disability service home and she was facilitating for a a young man who was i'm trying to think of what they called him um she was facilitating for this young man who has severe disabilities and what she was doing is he had no ability to speak, write, or use manual signs to communicate. Uh, sh she claims that she was able to speak to him through facilitated communication. So she would sit there and she'd hold his hand and he would spell out, spell out stuff. So what happened is, is this woman who is a grandmother with, you know, grandchildren, she felt an instant connection with the young man and over time it became an attraction. He told her over time that he loved her through facilitated communication. And in one instance, when the man was running around, unable to settle down, she took off her clothes and stood there before him. So then in another article about the court case, she apologizes to the family and to, and to the student and, all, and on and on. She's like, I didn't want to hurt him. But the mother in this article that I'm reading is really upset because she says, that she was really afraid of letting her child go into a a facility she was really worried her child would be abused and um the woman the facilitator who who raped her 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 she had oral i think she had, had oral sex with him yeah she at least put her mouth on his penis at one point right and uh the mother was upset because she's getting away she's going on with her life she says it was the hardest thing i could do to put my son in in um in this kind of care and then to have him abused like this and that she only got an 18 month sentence and it was a suspended sentence so she didn't have any i guess her ability to work in a facilitated communication uh, field or in this area um, is going to be she's going to have a hard time finding a job but what i thought was really interesting and this is maybe a whole different side note i'm reading two different articles in australia and the first line of one article, well, the headline is, I fell in love, grandma guilty of indecent dealing. And the first line says, a grandmother who says she fell in love with her severely autistic client has been convicted on two counts, counts of indecent dealing with him. 
I find it interesting. Now read, read that. And then I go to this other article and the first line is um, the woman's name, the facilitator wore a stylish red top and skirt as she awaited her fate after confessing to indecent dealings with a severely autistic client in her care. And then she says, the attractive woman who is a wife and grandmother had admitted to touching the penis of a client in her care with her hand in her mouth. It's like, why are you bringing up that she's a grandmother? Why is that even part? Who cares? She wore a stylish red top and skirt as she was being, she's waiting for her, her sentencing. And the attractive woman who is a wife and grandmother. Mm -hmm. that, it's like, you know, yeah, all this facilitating community. And then, then I read that I'm going, what the heck? This is from 2014. Are we not yet over that? I mean, would they put the man, this very attractive man with a little bit of stubble on his face, with his chiseled chin, is awaiting his, his, uh, you know, he, his, his sentence. In a well-pressed suit. Wore, and he had a well-pressed suit with a, with a tie that just matched his eyes. You know, it's like, yeah. he's a father of, three and you know and it's just like what i know they're yeah. trying to tell a story but my goodness do we have a lot of work to do in this world to get this nonsense out of here ken what's wrong with reporters just reporting the facts i could see maybe setting it up saying picture this here she is she's got a red top on a blue skirt and her hair is tied back in a bow, you know, with a bow at the back and, and the prosecutor who, you know, maybe you're trying to get some kind of visual image of what's happening in the, in the courtroom or something. Yeah, I get that, but. Well, they're softening, they're softening the abuse. They're softening that it happened to a dis disabled person. They're softening that it happened through facilitated communication. So they Mr. Did, Boy didn't they, mind so much. Yeah. Because she was, if she had been an ugly old, gross looking la 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 you know woman you know maybe they would the story would be different and maybe they'd be, be like oh well then that's not okay but it's okay because she's hot <laughs> right no i know like right <laughs> okay. i'm not i you know i don't usually get that upset about those kinds of things but for some reason that one would just hit my hit the fan with me it's like as i'm reading this going is this really the most important part of the story that we need to be talking about is how, how, what she was wearing and how hot she was and that she's a grandmother. Would that be given equal treatment in the, in the news if it was something else? You know, it's just. No, it's crazy. I, oh, I tell you, Janice, this, <laughs> we're supposed to be doing these to, talks to get over the, the horribleness in the world these days. <laughs> Well, what I'm <laughs> yeah, what I'm hoping is that, like, personally, I get asked these questions a lot, and now I'm I'm starting to have a resource for people to for me to say. If they want to watch this for three hours, hours talk. You know what, yeah. in that three you know hour what? talk, you're gonna you know find answers yeah. to the questions I just had. I mean, but it it's true. Yeah, these are long discussions, but there's there's some people who have stayed with this this whole time. And I really appreciate you guys because you're able to give us feedback as we go along and, and um, yeah, ask questions I to, and answer. Hmm? I did want to say that I think I think it's still up there, but I uh, I uploaded a lot of resources onto the About Time website. Yeah. Abouttimeproject.org has a whole on the left hand side. There's a whole column of um, uh, facilitated communication uh, resources. So that the so, yeah, if you're looking for articles or you know references or whatever, it's a lot of it's listed there. There's links uh, to most of it. If if there's something that people um, want to look at but they can't get because I have a lot of these articles, um, I've downloaded I've downloaded a ton of articles or whatever I can or generally could find somebody who has it if you're if you're looking for information but that would be a place to start you don't have to start from scratch there right. is a lot of I information think Mark would like to come in and say hi hi <laughs> he's standing over here how's everybody <laughs> he's going to be talking about we are definitely going to talk about the Ouija board and um 
and what do you want me to write here? We, we, we started talking a lot about psychics and how this actually ties into the psychic world. What we're talking about with the facilitated. Community. Yeah, that would be fun to do a comparison between F. Yeah. And, and the Ouija board. That would be really interesting to see how the idiomotor effect. I'm all prepared for doing something like that. Uh, so I'll be, right back. I, I'll be right back. Just one sec. Okay. So I'm, so I will hold this while Janice comes right back. Um, I should mention that <laughs> Mark, Mark, somebody in the comments said, can you sing the Susan Gerbic song? <laughs> <laughs> Susan Gerbic, Susan Gerbic. Not unless she does what I ask her to he do. He wants me to photograph him because he had, uh, and I'm going to, I want to photograph him because he had chemo and his hair came back with a, a wave, you know? Uh -huh. And so it's getting so long now. Uh, that it's about to grow out enough that it's going to lose the wave. So I want to show I want to show his hair with the you know before it becomes too long to do it. So I put on a nice shirt so that I can photograph him. I said I'd photograph him after I'm done with this. He gave me that look like, can you photograph him? <laughs> so uh, people out there who are watching this, Janice and I are not even slightly done with doing him. I'm still enjoying doing him. I think Janice is too, even though. Um, you know, this was a tough one at first, but I, I got over it. I'm fine. <laughs> she got over it. And there's a lot more case studies out there that we haven't touched on. There's a whole, as, as Paulinda put up in the YouTube, I mean, in the, um, in the show, in the feed for the Facebook, there are a lot of uh, things that we haven't even touched on. There's a list that people can look into and you can go down to the citations at the bottom to read the news articles on it. And um, so we are doing the series of talks. Um, you can go to the YouTube channel and please subscribe. As we finish these, we will upload them to our YouTube channel. One of my GSOW editors, uh, Richard uh, McDonald, is cleaning up the audio and the and the lighting and adding, you know, screen caps and stuff to them to make them look a little more professional. I didn't do that in the early days. And um, if you subscribe to About Time Project on Facebook, you will be notified when we're going to be doing some talks in the future. And you'll also can turn on notifications so that when I'm live on Facebook, you'll get a notification. It's not much a warning. It's like a minute. <laughs> I, I do have a talk coming up on next Wednesday. Let me look at my notes here real quick. So we can't talk next Wednesday. Uh, okay. I'm going to be interviewing, uh, you know, I just hate trying to, Abajet, Abajet. I'll practice. I, I promise I'll get your name right. He has a website. Uh, he has a podcast, um, a critical thinking podcast in India. Abhijay. Abhijay. I, I'll practice. I promise. Well, he's going to be Wednesday at 11 o'clock. Oh, that's cool. As we started with Janice. And Janice and I are going to probably do uh, another talk next week, but maybe with um, uh, Craig Foster or Jim, Jim Todd. Or yeah, we've got a couple of people um, lined up. Um, we've also got a yes from Mark Mostert, who did um, some systematic reviews um, on facilitated communication. He's going to talk to us about evidence, what makes testing evidence based. Um, and I and I've got a yes also from Howard Shane, I believe. Hopefully, I'm not speaking out of turn, but I think he's going to he's going to come on too and talk about um, some of the work he's been doing with people with. Um, autism and communication techniques and stuff. Right. So that's going to be really exciting. I'm looking forward to that. It'll be a lot less than me talking. Uh, I think I have Monday, Tuesday open. On Friday, Nexus is going to start. Well, Nexus will start in the evening. So maybe Friday is also the 31st is open for me. So whatever is open is fine with me, just as long as you don't get me too early in the morning because I am not a morning person. Yeah, we'll figure it out. <laughs> So I hope everybody enjoyed. Um, thank you for staying around. That was really interesting. And like I said, we have a lot still to go to, um, to get through this topic. Just this one topic. Wow. Amazing, Janice. Thank you so much Good. for joining me. Yeah, thank you. That's fun. Okay. okay. Bye, everybody. See you Bye. soon.